mercy and for the forever. Lord is good. And his mercy and for the Lord forever. is good. And his mercy, mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I put the same thing repeat for us to repeat it to ourselves. Say to yourself that but the Lord is good and his mercy and just forever. Regardless of what I'm going through, the Lord is good, his mercy towards me is everlasting. For the Lord is good and his mercy and just forever. Oh Lord, you are good and your mercy and just forever. Oh, you are good towards me and your mercy and just forever. Oh Lord, you are good. Oh Lord, you are good. Oh God, you are good. You are good. Father, you are good. Father, you are good. Bashanda. Eria Bakuri Bashanda. E Barra Bakuri Bashande. Oh Sataya Bashanda. Yaria Bakuri Bashande. E Rababakama. E Sataya. Oh, Lord, you are good and your mercy and yours forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and yours forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and yours forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and yours forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and yours forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and yours forever. E paraco shande, oria bahabar hadap, e parige shanda, aria bahori bashande, aria bahuria, e bashanda, e barraba, o sotoba. Holy and the rabble is the rebel. 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 Holy and the rabble and the rebel 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 Appreciate the name of the Lord in the Holy Ghost. Holy and the Holy Ghost. Holy the Holy and the Holy and the Holy and the Holy Holy the Holy and 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 the the Edify yourself with the language of the Holy Ghost. the 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 Holy and the rebel in the rebel. Let God the rebel and the rebel and the rebel. Holy and the da 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 da. Let God the rebel in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we say. Amen. Psalm 136 says that we should give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good and his mercy endures forever. In that understand, we are going to.
thank the Almighty God. Let's appreciate the name of the Lord. Let's thank God for our lives. Let's thank God for the service. Let's thank God for the turnaround. Let's thank God for Brian. Let's thank God for his family. Let's thank God for all the pastors. Let's thank God. Let's appreciate the name of the Lord this morning in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, we appreciate you. Oh Lord, na na na. We give thanks unto you, Jesus. We give you thanks, Jesus. And your word said that it is good to praise you. Lord, we know that it is good to praise you. So we are here to say thank you. Only on the rebel and the rebel. And then the rebel and the rebel. Manama, she the rebel. We appreciate you, Jesus. We appreciate you, Jesus. We appreciate you, Jesus. And then the rebel. Manama, she the rebel. Holy Let the rebel man a machine the rebel and the rebel and the rebel. Holy and the rebel and the rebel. And the rebel. We appreciate you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are good and your mercy is enduring forever. Let's thank him because he is good and his mercy endures forever. Oh Lord, we thank you. Because you are good and your mercy endures forever. Holy Ananamash and the rebel and the rebel and the rebel. We thank you, O oh God. Oh, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, O oh God, for choosing us. We thank you for drawing us close to you. We thank you, amazing Jesus. We thank you. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. You are good. And your mercy endures forever, Jesus. And We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you because your foundation, only young and rubber. Your word is more sure than ever. Lord, we thank you for your word that will come to us today. Lord, we thank you for deliverance. Let's thank God for deliverance. Holy Yana, na, 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 na. Let's thank God for his mercy. Let's thank God for his goodness. Let's thank God for deliverance. Let's thank God because he's here with us. Holy Yana, my sheep, the rebel, and the rebel. Holy Yana, na, 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 na. Holy Yana, the rebel. Amen. Jesus, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Holy and the rebel in the rebel. In the name of Jesus. Holy and the rebel and the rebel. Holy and the rebel and the rebel. Holy and the rebel. Holy and the rebel and the rebel. Holy and the rebel and the rebel. Holy and the rebel and the rebel. the rebel and the rebel. Holy and 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 the rebel and the rebel. Today, service into the hands of God. Let's ask that the Holy Spirit, let's ask that God the Father, God the Son, will come down by Himself and manifest Himself this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy yonder rabbi. But many that come with one issue or the other, they will encounter Jesus today in the name of Jesus. My Father, we praise you, O God, because we know that you are here with us. Lord Jesus, come down and have your way. Come out your way, come out your way, come out your way. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Holy Ghost. Today's service is in your hands. Have your way, have your way, have your way. Have your way, have your way to your glory. Have your way, I am that I am. Have your way, Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We invite you. We welcome you. We welcome you. Holy and the rabble and the 
Take the stage. Take the stage in the name of Jesus. Take the stage in the name of Jesus. Take the stage in the name of Jesus. Take the stage, Lord. Take the stage. Take the stage, Lord, in the name of Jesus.
Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We all know the ministry of the blood of Jesus. Now we are going to apply that blood in today's service and in our lives and families. Let's pray that the blood of Jesus will speak for us in the mighty name of Jesus. And let the rebel man and shin the rebel. Oh Jesus, we call on your blood. We plead your blood. In the atmosphere in the name of Jesus. We plead your blood. And the atmosphere. We plead your blood. We apply the blood of Jesus. The blood that speaks ever better than the blood of Abel. We apply that blood in our lives, in our homes, in our world.
shield by fire. We are shield by the blood of Jesus. We are shield by fire. We are shield by the blood of Jesus. We are shield by fire. We are shield by the blood of Jesus. We are shield by fire. We are shield by the blood of Jesus. We are shield by fire. We are shield by the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. I want us to use this many two minutes to pray for our children. Let's add that they are shielded by the blood. Music will not take their life. No music will even come near them in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's pray that no demon, no, no disease, no affliction will come before our children. And the pregnant women, we pray that they will deliver the Hebrew women in the name of Jesus. We shall not mourn over any pregnant woman. We will not mourn over any of our children. We will not bury our children. Let the rebel, let the rebel, let the rebel, let the rebel. We will not bury our children. We will not mourn over them. By the power of the Holy Ghost, let the rebel, let the rebel. Holy and the da 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 da. Holy and the rebel, let the rebel. Holy and the rebel. They are shot by the blood of Jesus. The pregnant women and the and the children. They are shot by the blood in the name of Jesus. Holy and da 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 da. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let your glory be above. All the earth, let your glory be above. All the let your glory, let your glory be above. All the let your glory, let your glory be above. All the this service open in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost in Jesus name. Amen. over this place. Let's give God glory. Give him glory. For he alone is worthy. Lord, we give you glory. Oh, we give you glory. the earth. 
praise. One more time. We give you all the glory. I honor the Lord. Honor and praise. Only the church now. Only the church. With our hands lifted up. We give you. We One more time, we give you all the glory. Honor. For the very last time, we give you all the glory. And when we give him all the glory and praise, he releases victories in our lives. Can we give him a shout of praise? Clap your hands together. And we want to say, here's my victory dance. Somebody give him a shout of praise. Somebody who knows that you have the victory from January, February, March, April. And today you are standing. Can you give the Lord a shout of praise? Now say, neighbor, I win without fighting. I win without trying. Every time I win because the Lord is on my side. Because the Lord is on my side. Give him a shout of praise. Oh, we win, we win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we win. Because we've got God. Oh, we win, yeah. Without trying. Every time. Because we've got Here's my victory, here's my victory and sure To Jehovah, he has never lost a battle From me, what's this name? Hey, now you know, now you define Here's my victory, here's my victory, here's my victory then Oh God, oh God, he has never lost a battle Oh God Victory dance, yeah. A victory dance, oh. To the He has never lost. It's too late. But to Grotto. Oh, God, oh. Are you there, boy? Let's go. Yeah. We win, we win, we win, we win, we win. Oh, we win. Come on. We win. Because we have got God. Try it every time. 
is my God on us. It's my victory. It's my victory. You Jehovah. He has never lost us. Come on now. It's you. What's this name? Oh God. Can you define? He's my victory. He's my victory. He's my victory. He's my victory. You Jehovah. Have you seen the Lord lie? And as he feels, he has never lost a battle. No, no, no. It's too late. What's this name? I'm so Now you defy. We take it again. We go. I will say now. Have you seen the Lord lie? And as he feels, he has never lost a battle. No, no, no. From it to it, what's this name? I will let them know. 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 I will let them
let them know. I will 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 let them know. Let's go. I will let them know. I will let them know. One more time. Let's go. I will let them know. 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 Everything that had bread, praise the Lord. Lift up your praise. Oh, Father, you're worthy. You alone are worthy. You alone are deserving. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven, you came running. There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
dear Badosha, I just want us to give thanks unto God for his good and his mercies endures forever. For every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of light in which there is no variation or shadow of turning. Let's just begin to thank the one who is good, whose mercies indeed endures forever. Mandele ba sundele ke ya ba 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 reke de bosa zinda la bando loko si ana mandele ke de ke de bande de bosa arana mano si ana mande reke de bosa for you are good you are kind machine de bosa indeed your mercy endures forever your mercy endures forever for indeed every good and perfect gift comes from above comes from the father of light in which there is no variation or shadow of turning machine de le kere bosa ma re kere kere bo zinda la bande le kere bosa ratana mande le bosa in the good times god is good in the bad times god is good in the not so great times god is good god is constantly good he is constantly good mande le ba son de le kere baya thank you jesus Mashana mane kere ba sundele kere kere rokolo bosa e yana ma indeed your mercy and yours forever mashundele ke ya da bandele kere bosa marana mande li abashunda la bandele ke yana mando father we thank you father we thank you we see your goodness all around us your goodness is evident in our lives we give you all the glory lord we give you all the honor lord cuz indeed you deserve all the glory father we say thank you the house of oasis is thankful thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus for you are good you are kind and your mercy indeed endures forever thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus Thank you Jesus. 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 In Jesus name we've prayed. In Jesus name we've prayed. Everyone looks so beautiful. Everyone look so beautiful this morning. I would just like that you uh, move to your talk to your neighbor to the left and the right and say you are wonderfully and fearfully made. You are wonderfully and fearfully made. I'm not seeing people turn. Are you do you mean that you are not wonderfully and fearfully made? You are wonderfully and fearfully made and you look so beautiful and so handsome this morning. Praise God. Everyone looks so gorgeous this morning and so handsome. We bless God for his goodness in our lives. And um, we want to welcome our most special people in the house today. I like that. I like that. So if today is the first time that you are in the oasis, I would like that you please indicate by raising up your hands and you also stand up. If today is your first time in the oasis, I would like that you please indicate by raising up your hands and also standing up. So if you are around them, I would like that you please give them the oasis welcome.
studio aces that song was specially written and composed for you and we're so excited to see each and every one of you we're so glad that the lord led your steps into our house we prayed for you and all of you that have come today you are answered prayers this is the oasis we are a house of refreshment for a generation hungry and thirsty for the presence, power, and love of God. This is a house where men and women of excellent character are raised. Um, the Oasis is built on the RCCG mission, as this is the RCCG the Oasis. And the mission and vision of RCCG is to make heaven, to take as many people with us, to have a member of RCCG in every family of all nations, to accomplish one, number one above, which is to make heaven, and holiness will be our lifestyle to accomplish number two and three above, and we will plant churches within five minutes walking distance in every city and town of developing countries, and within five minutes of driving distance in every city and town of developed countries. We will pursue these objectives until every nation in the world is rich for our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. The Oasis is also built on the seven pillars, like a pillar that's what holds our house, and this is prayer the world, holiness, purity, and character, true spirited and exuberant worship like you experience from Sound of Many Waters, order and excellence within the context of the liberty of the Holy Spirit, a burning passion for the lost, which is the Great Commission, love, friendship, family, and community. Praise God. We also have our services in this auditorium by 8 a.m., which starts with Sunday school. And we have our midweek service in this auditorium, which we call Search the Scriptures, on Wednesday by 6 p.m. Um, if you do not have a church that you worship in, we'll ask that you come and be part of the Oasis. You're only a first-timer once, and when you come again, you're part of this one big family. But if you do have a church that you worship in, we're glad that you're planted and you're part of the body. But anytime that you're within our environs, we're just enjoying you to come and worship with us. The ushers may have handed you some cards during the welcome. We'd like that you please fill these cards with your correct details and wait shortly after service to meet with the welcome team at this side of the auditorium and we'll just welcome you. Praise God. You may have your seats. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you, Sound of Many Waters. Testimony time. Testimony time. We have some physical testimonies and we also have some um, written testimonies. So I'll read the physical. I'll read, read the physical testifiers. So Sister Jesse told me, Sister Uluwa told me, Brother Franklin, Sister Doin, Sister John, Sister Tammy Tokwe, Brother Promise, Sister Favor, Sister Alice. I'll go, that, I'll go over that again. Sister Jesse told me, Sister Uluwa told me, Brother Franklin, Sister Doin. Sister Joan, Sister Tim Takwe, but I promise, Sister Favor, Sister Alice, you can just please make your way to this side of the auditorium. Praise God. So the written testimony is, Sister Itoro is thanking God for the successful completion of our NYC. Her POP, praise God. Her POP was on Thursday. She's also thanking God for her birthday, which was yesterday, and for giving her joy overflowing. Praise God. Sister Maria is thanking God for the workings of the Holy Spirit in her life, for God's preservation over her family, and for all-round provision. Praise God. Sister Ade Shakwe is thanking God for adding another year to her age on Friday, for his faithfulness in her life over the years, and may his name be praised forevermore. Amen. Praise God. Sister Sandra is thanking God for giving her a new job with a better pay. She, praise God. She didn't apply. The Lord just made it happen at the right time. May his name be praised. Sister Emmanuel, Emanuela rather, is thanking God for the salvation of her soul. She's also thanking God for his faithfulness over her life and her family. Lastly, she's thanking God on behalf of her friend, who has been believing God for a good paying job since he graduated in 2020. After praying about it during the Hallelujah Challenge, he got a job offer on the 29th of March and was told to resume on the 2nd of this month. She's come to return glory to God because he alone is the doer. Praise God. Mr. Amze Favor. 
Stella Muse is thanking God for being intentional about him, from delivering him from an attack of the enemy. A few weeks ago, he felt sick so much that he couldn't stand up to ease himself. He prayed with the little strength he had that night, and one of the pastorate's team prayed for him and gave him assurance that the following morning he won't see the affliction again. And so it happened. He's grateful to God who helped him and who has been shielding him from every attack. Praise God. Sister Itsunu Oluwa Oluwatui. Sister Itsunu is thanking God for revelation and for her sister's life. Last month on the 6th, she had a dream that she lost her younger sister. She dreamt repeatedly three times that week. And when she woke up, she prayed with one of the NSPPG's declaration that she will not bury and she will not be buried. That same day, on the 6th, PM posted on the church WhatsApp group prayers concerning abundant life. She also prayed with us and told her other siblings to join her. She's thanking God that he already saw what was going to happen and he showed her in her dream. Last week, her younger sister was robbed in a public bus in Lagos. They collected her phone, her wallet. She said she and the other passengers were dragging with them and the thieves threatened that they would push them down if they don't release their belongings. God aborted their plans from pushing them down as it could have been worse. She's thankful to God for preservation of life. She prays that God will continue to protect us and our families in Jesus' name. Praise God. Sister Oluwa Fumilayo is thanking God for a new age. God has been good and consistent in the past years. He is bringing her into great things in this new year. She's so grateful. She prophesies that celebrations will not cease among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Sister Thelma is thanking God for the salvation of her soul. For God's awesome love and guidance. She had a very sharp pain which was very uncomfortable. Especially when she breathes in a sensitive part of her body. She prayed and returned it to the pit of hell. Abba showed her his great mercy. Today she's well. She's breathing in peace. She prophesies to anyone in any... Prophesies to anyone in any kind of body pain that Abba will heal you and speedily in Jesus' name. Praise God. Sister Edward is thanking God for favor. She had just started attending the Oasis of Recent. There was a Sunday person that was preaching about power. She participated. She participated in a certain funds for her small business. After that Sunday, the following day, which was the final day for the competition was the Monday she got the funds. She could not believe it, but God came through for her, and she prays that this is just the beginning for her. Amen. Stanley is thanking God for saving her and her sister from an accident to, due to the vehicle's faulty brake. She's thankful to God that the driver was able to avoid running into another moving vehicle. She's also grateful to God for helping her and keeping her motivated with her fitness journey. He has been helping her, waking her up to have her early morning works. She's trusting that God will keep her, keep helping her until she achieves all her fitness goals. Praise God. Sister Augusta is thanking God for deliverance from demonic dreams. Some weeks back, every night she will have dreams of either eating in the dream or other scary dreams which she might not remember when she wakes up. It became so bad that she got scared of closing her eyes to sleep at night. On Sunday, we were given communion to take home and eat by 6 p.m. She got home and prayed over the communion and declared 1 Corinthians 10 verse 21, believing that as she eats the communion, which represents the body and blood of Jesus, so every eating and demonic dream shall end. To the glory of God, ever since that day, she has never had those demonic dreams. Praise God. And she gives glory to God that had Deliverance is permanent in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Erica is thanking God for her life and for the lives of her family members, for preservation, for journey mercies to Emo State back and forth, and for a successful burial of her grandpa, for financial increase and peace. Praise God. Sister Hope is thanking God for being faithful to her and her family. Just last week, her younger sister, who's been looking for a job since January, got a new job. Her elder sister got promoted at work. God blessed her brother with a bouncing baby boy. And she's come to return all glory to God. Praise God. <laughs> sister Lovelyn is thanking God for restoration. Last Sunday, her phone was stolen on her way to church. 
She was very sad because it was a new phone. She cried on the road like a child. Passersby told her to go back home, but she remembered Pastor Ben at TKC who said that he went to church the morning he lost his son to ministers and usher, and afterwards the Lord restored. She summoned courage and went to church. As soon as she got to church, she knelt before the altar and prayed in tears. During the thanksgiving, she danced like never before. She's come to give glory to God, for he has restored what was stolen in over a hundred fools. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise God. To the physical testifiers, Sister Jesse told me, Sister Uluwa told me, Brother Franklin, Sister Doin, Sister Joanne, Sister Timmy Tope, but I promise, Sister Favor, Sister Alice, I was blind, now I see. When you hear me say hallelujah, please begin to round up your testimony. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. I want to thank God, first of all, for the salvation of my soul. I want to thank God for my family, for deliverance. I want to thank God, especially for my younger sister. God is going to have another year to our life tomorrow. I want to thank God for deliverance from, God just delivered her. Over a month ago, she was very ill. They had to transfuse her. And after the transfusion, she started having seizures. They were so much to the extent that she was not even aware of what was happening in her surroundings. She lost consciousness. I want to thank God for restoring her. She was, the seizures were so much that she was, in fact, they had to wear an adult diaper for her. And I thank God for the prayer unit. They raised up prayer for me, my Oasis Junior Church. They raised up prayers and we were praying. And God restored her. I want to give God all the glory. I want to give God all the honor for restoring her. I want to thank God for his mercies. And she was discharged last week Sunday. I want to thank God because I know that perfection, for every other thing that is perfection, God has done it. There's a change of genotype. There's new kidneys. There's new blood cells for her in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. I want to thank God for his mercy and particularly for saving me. My boss, while going to work on Thursday, was in an accident and I came out unscathed. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want to thank God for his faithfulness in my life and my family and also his very timely word in this house. Um, in December last year, Pastor Nat led a prayer, um, praying for people that were having issues with condemnation. And prior to that time, for the past couple of years, I've been having bowel issues. I started seeing doctors last year, and they couldn't tell what was wrong. They didn't know if it was ulcer. At some point, they said my spleen was enlarged, my heart was enlarged. I was seeing cardiologists, hematologists, and whatnot. And so when he made that prayer, I came out and I, I cried my eyes out to God. And then I traveled for the holidays. When I came back, I went back to see my doctor and she was like, nothing is wrong with me, that I should just go. And since then, I usually have crises every now and then. If I eat, sometimes I vomit till my stomach is empty. When I don't eat, I vomit. It was just a lot. But since this year, I've not had any crisis. I've not had a reason to go to the emergency room. I'm so grateful to God. Secondly, um, on the Oasis Thanksgiving in January... When Pastor Nat came on the altar again, he said a prayer about death. It was Thanksgiving, so I didn't understand why he was praying about death. I prayed a prayer, and right after, I picked up my phone and turned on my data. And my sister, who was seven months pregnant, she was sending messages crying that she was just involved in an accident going to church. She was driving, and a car hit her, and her stomach hit the steering. She left the car and ran to the hospital. I was so scared, but we had prayed, so I just thanked God. Last month, she gave birth to a healthy baby. It was seamless. I'm so grateful to God, and I'm continuously humbled by his goodness. May his name be glorified. In Jesus name. Praise the Lord, church. I just want to thank God for his faithfulness concerning me. Um, I have a couple of testimonies. I'll make them as short as possible. So, my first testimony is during the early part of this year, I'd had calls to travel long interstate journeys via road. I just want to thank God for safety, that I traveled multiple times, no accidents, no 
I'm, I'm Robbie Attack, nothing on the road. I just want to thank God for his safety concerning me. I also want to thank God for uh, provision in the area of my finances. Um, I want to give an instance. Um, I think during January or so, I had rent due, and I was just trying to make up the money, and there was no, I didn't have enough to cover the balance, and I had just paid my tithe. And out of nowhere, I just received an alert that was exactly the balance for my rent, but uh, I, was, <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. I just want to thank God. And also, lastly, I want to thank God for an answered prayer because for a while now, I have been trusting in God for career progression, and God answered spectacularly last, last month by granting me a new job that with better pay, and I just want to thank God and give him all the glory, and I see his name be forever glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. Good morning, church. I just want to thank God for a new year. On Wednesday was my birthday, and I want to thank God for growth. Thank you. I want to thank God for growth, especially in my work with God. I want to thank God for how far he has brought me. I want to thank God for this church. I'm, I'm in awe of how much I've grown in God. I'm just so grateful to God. I want to thank God for career progression, and I want to thank God for exams. So said I had um, the whole of my match. I was just writing exams, but I want to thank God for success. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, church. I thank God for the salvation of my soul. I thank God for financial favor. I also thank God for the opportunity to be here this morning. It can only be good. I also want to thank God for adding a year to my year. I also want to, because repeatedly I've always been badly depressed from one depression to another, but the Lord what came for me. Friends keep calling, oh, Alice, I was praying and I could hear, thank God for Alice, thank God for Alice. Repeatedly, and my birthday, I woke up that morning, held, happy. I was so, I was so grateful that I was just happy. Then later that evening, from within, I just got heavy. But I think that everything, the Lord restored me. The Lord restored my peace. I was happy. My sanity was there. I'm thankful for the growth so far. I want to thank you, Jesus. I said, when I did that. Morning, church. My name is Oluwatu Misi Mustafa. I want to thank God for the gift of life, the salvation of my soul, and I want to thank God for delivering me and my family from a wildfire that broke out in our estate, and it was growing very fast. And I just want to thank God that they were building a house close to our house, so there were heaps of sand surrounding our house, and that was what protected the fire from coming into our house. And I also want to thank God for giving them the wisdom to stop the fire before there was massive like destruction i want to thank god for the gift of his word that has continued to bless me thank you jesus praise god church my name is timmy tokwe i'd like to thank god for the salvation of my soul i'd like to thank god for success in my exam so a bit of backstory. I started an exam 11 years ago, and for some reason it just felt like I was stuck. I tried everything, it wasn't working. And normally I'll read average of three hours per day, six months into the exam. So imagine doing that for like that long. And um, God told me that if I didn't get my relationship with him right, there will always be that hole. So along the line I became born again. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm born again, let me try again. I tried again, I didn't pass. I got frustrated and I saw PN. And then he prayed for me, and he said to me that you will write the exam and you will pass. I believe what he said because it bore witness in my heart. And then I was like, <laughs> I just felt like I was missing something. So I was talking to my sister, and she said that oftentimes when we are stuck, it means that there is a lesson you're supposed to learn before you move forward. Then I just decided to focus on God and not bother about it again. And then along the line, God just revealed to me that, yes, he wanted me to write the exam, but my rationale for writing it was wrong, that he is my validation, not my certification. And then it also taught me that, he also taught me that um, 
te taught me dedication because it's not really easy to read for that long, three hours for six months into an exam for that long. And, and also it taught me that my source of intelligence is him, not in my certification. Glory be to God. And I just want to prophesy to anyone trusting God for the same miracle that God will open your eyes for the lessons for the season and he will grant you easy success. Amen. She passed a very... How many of you know CFA? That's, that, that's what she's just saying, small, small like that. I told her, I called her years ago, I said, and I said, I'm seeing marriage on your life. She said, no, I want to pass CFA, CFA. I said, marry first, you get CFA. She married and she has CFA. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to thank God for his deliverance upon my life. So many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them from them all. God has delivered me. I have been seized of a lot of deliverance God has granted in my life. I just want to say, may his name be glorified in Jesus' name. So secondly, I was in a dream last week. So in that dream, we are in the church like this, and he and our daddy said that he felt led to lay hands on people so that anyone um, that wants to be led hands on shall come out. So I was last on the line. So, and when it got my turn, he and looked at me and said, there is something God has given to me, deposited in me. Why am, why am I not giving him back what has given to me? So he took me from here. He was standing here. He took me to the altar. He asked me a series of questions. After that, I woke up on that dream. And I'm here to make that dedication all of you be the witness that I want to give God what I've given back to me. Praise God. I just want to thank him. His name be thank Praise God. I have a testimony. I want to thank God for the salvation of my soul. That is my biggest testimony. I want to thank God because um, a few weeks ago, I, had a, I turned a year older. I want to thank God because God is faithful. Um, during my birthday last year, PN had prayed for me, and one thing he has said is like, I pray, I hear restoration, and I pray restoration for you. And I stand here to declare to the glory of God that everything far above my imagination, the Lord has restored. Like, far above my imagination, the Lord has restored. He's gone over and beyond. I really want to thank God. I ask God for one birthday gift, and God gave me that gift just right before my birthday. I come to return all thanks to God, because God indeed is good. Praise God. Now let's just stand up and just thank God for the testimonies that we've heard. Let's just be intentional about thanking God for healings that we've heard, for the Lord being Jehovah Rapha, for new jobs, for deliverances from accidents, for dreams, for revelations, for growth in God, for salvation of soul, for people being planted. We just want to say thank you for deliverance from the fire. Father, we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The house of Oasis is indeed thankful that every day, oh God, we come, oh God, every Sunday we come, oh God, and we have testimonies. We see your goodness. Indeed, you are good and you are kind. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we say thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the testimonies, oh God. For what you do for one, you can do for all. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that anyone believing God for a testimony, oh God, we pray that you replicate it in their lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we say thank you. We have come to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. The house of Oasis is thankful mandele basundele kiana mando marreke de kere bande libano se ni manande ratana mande liko sina mane kiana mandele bosa father we say thank you mashene mano sikini manande thank you for the testimonies thank you for the testimonies for the new jobs oh god for people being alive to see new years father we say thank you father we say for removal of depression for joy in our innermost being father we say thank you father we say thank you thank you jesus thank you jesus that indeed every sunday we have something to thank you about thank you jesus thank you jesus because indeed the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy thank you jesus in jesus name we prayed it's time for a titan offering 
If you gave your tithe during the week, you can just please stand up while I will pray for you. The ushers might have handed you some envelopes, but if they haven't, they'll probably hand them over to you now. The account details will be put on the screen for you to make your electronic transfers. And I think the ushers also have the POS machines if you want to make um, pay with your cards. So let's just thank God for, Father, we pray, Lord, for everyone that has brought their tithes into your storehouse, Lord. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that concerning these ones, we rebuke the devourers for their sake in the name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, that they will continually experience abundance, that they will experience mega grace in the name of Jesus. We pray for everyone that has brought their offerings into this house, oh God, for the propagation of the gospel, oh God. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will bless them, oh Oh God, you will bless them and you will fill their bands and it will run over in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this one, oh God, that they will always have more to bring to your house in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Philippians 2 9 that God had exalted Jesus and given him a name that is above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue that will, he will confess that he is Lord but Jesus didn't just keep that on himself he gave us that name so that as Romans 10 13 says those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved so we just want to bless that name. We just want to thank him for that name this morning. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, our Lord, most high. You're hidden. second verse together you didn't want heaven Whether it is death, whether it is sickness, whether 
carry the spear, they bow at the mention of the name of Jesus. So we sing this part together. We say, we say, death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silence the
confession and according to Jeremiah 33 verse 3 Jeremiah 33 verse 3 that says call unto me and I will answer thee and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not that Bible verse tells us that as we seek God daily he's willing to reveal the deep things of the world and if you don't even understand some things, he's ready to bring everything to our remembrance. As we read the declaration for today, I pray that the Lord God would open our eyes to see the deep things of the world. And it will give us the wisdom and guidance in doing the right things in Jesus' name. So as it's our custom... Um, I will read and then you read with me. Are we ready? We declare that 2024 is the year that we journey into the deep things of God. We are deeply rooted and grounded in love, established in the word and abounding in prayer and thanksgiving. By the help and guidance of the spirit of truth, we are able to comprehend the breadth, the length, depth, and height of God. This year, we grow deep roots in Christ, growing in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man and bearing fruits of love upwards. This year, we shall experience first-hand undeniable proofs and evidence of our new creation realities. We journey deep into God in prayer, word, worship, and fellowship, and experience daily and practical manifestation or spiritual realities that further reinforce 
and establish our faith and trust in God. We access, know, and touch God's heart and experience His hand and grace like never before. The supply and manifestation of the Spirit is common to us. The Word of God grows and prevails amongst us. Miracles, signs, and wonders are a part of us. We have the mind of Christ. Therefore, we think the thoughts of God, know the ways of God, and do the works of God. Truly, we are an oasis, a fruitful and pleasant place. Truly, we are an oasis, a fruitful and pleasant place. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. God bless you. Put your hands together for Jesus. Come on. Come on. Amen. There was a song that came into my heart while I was sitting there.
Say good news. Say good news. If you shout it, you will see it. If you shout it, you will hear it. Let's read one to go. As cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Say in the name of Jesus. Say I declare this week, this month, I shall hear good news from a far country. You better open your mouth and pray. The oasis will hear good news from a far country. Good news. Good news. Good news from a far country. Good news. Good news. Good news. Shall abound in this house. In every life. Good news. Good news. Good news. Somebody is not praying. If you if you declare it, you see it. Say, I shall hear good news from a far country. The oasis will receive good news. Good news from a far country. Thirty more seconds. Good news. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. I can smell something burning. Let's check that out. Amen. I have these super sensors in my notes. So let's check it. And then every every now and then, because we are upgrading, getting new gears, new equipment, we 
have to make adjustment. Let's check. Check, I can smell it. It's not in the spirit now. <laughs> I can smell it literally. Where are our technicians? Quickly, quickly. Quickly, we said good news. That's not good news. <laughs> Amen. But be calm. Be calm. So if we have to switch off a, a few things first. Amen. Tell somebody, cool the temper. Uh, have you found it? You found it. It's nothing major, have you? Okay, good, good. That's good news. Say good news. <laughs> Receive good news in the name of Jesus. Can I prophesy over this house? Can you see that, you know, the oasis just abounds. We're growing in leaps and bounds, in stature, in favor. Receive good news. I say receive good news. Receive good news. Spiritually and otherwise. In Jesus' mighty name. Before you sit down, go to seven people and tell them good news, good news, good news, good news. Seven people. your hands together for okay sounds of many waters sit down quickly you may come up again amen thank you all very much for wishing my wife and I very well thank you and as I prayed yesterday I declare that the Lord will fill your mouth with laughter your Isaac has come your Rebecca has come Already God has shown this house such favor. I said we have over 30 people, 30 couples already who have registered in tents to marry. Just first quarter, 30. 30. In fact, if you are one of them, stand. Let me see you. Stand now before you now. If you are one of them and you are not standing, I pity you. Come on. If you are one of them, you are not standing. You will join yourself at the wedding. You you wed yourself. You better stand. Quick. <laughs> Amen. Some of them are walking. Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. There's such grace and favor over our house. My job is simple. I want to do some housekeeping. Swap is in the evening. Say swap is in the evening. So, it's our monthly night of worship where we raise incense to God. It is also strategic because it's like an altar that we intentionally raise to God for the month. Amen. So the things that are happening in church don't just happen by chance. The deliverances, the breakthroughs, we are intentional with prayer. Hope you know we've been on a 30-day prayer challenge. Amen. Amen. So there's so much that happens at the back end, you know, spiritually that that you know, manifest as, you know, this beautiful atmosphere and the blessing that you receive. So, my advice is that everybody here comes back in the evening. So, what we do is we worship, we prophesy, we pray, we anoint ourselves and we take the Holy Communion and we shape the month. Amen. We literally speak into our month and shape the month. So, it's an altar. Now, let me say this. In the last one week, there's been a lot of news of people drowning. And because God has placed us as watchmen, every now and then, we're, 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 we're looking at things not the way everybody looks at things. I remember one time when they were about to repair Todd Milan Bridge. There was literally a sacrifice on that bridge. How many of you saw the video? 
they had a sacrifice. It was not at night, not in the spirit, open before they started the work. That was an altar they raised. And on that same Third Mainland Bridge, this week, a, a bus was over speeding and, you know, lost control, slammed on the culvert, and two people from the bus fell into the water. Somebody says, oh, that's a coincidence. No. Nah. In fact, I had one idea. Maybe I'll just load up a bus with a couple of us and just do a ride back and forth, praying in tongues through and just blow my horn over that place. It's just a thought. And then we heard about the actors who went on a, an expedition, acting expedition, and they drowned in one week. So seven people. The police reported there were seven drownings in one week. Those are altars speaking. Something crying out. Amen. So we, I, we, we know about altars. We will raise it tonight and place a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise and offerings upon it and altars speak. Amen. So please be available for that. It's very strategic, spiritually strategic. Also, I'm going to meet all the leaders briefly, HODs and Imagine Leaders shortly just to share some things that are on, on our hearts and what we will be doing. Amen. And um, I told you that the church is acquiring another space upstairs. We want to use that for Teens Church, okay, so that we, we, we have an environment for our teenagers who sometimes sit here to have their own community. So we want to begin to raise their, their leadership team. So uh, there are a few people I've, I've identified, but let me just say this. If for any reason you, you have a passion, a call for the teens and you're a worker, just see me after the service or see us after the service. Amen. How many of you were at the Oasis Kingdom World Academy yesterday? Come on, put your hands together if you were there. Can you celebrate the team? Were you blessed yesterday? I can't hear you. Are you excited about what's coming? Amen. So let's celebrate the team. I mean, all bars on your team, please stand. Incredible work they did. Great job. Please celebrate them now. These guys, I gave them a matching order and they exceeded, you know, our expectations. May the Lord bless you and honor you so please visit the website and um, do what you know you're asked to do so that we we march on with that mandate. Amen. Amen. Okay. I think I have announcement. Okay, I'm going to see the leadership of the choir after the service just to share an idea that I have I had during the OSIS Kingdom World Academy yesterday. So let me see them. And then either also see me after the service. Amen. Amen. After the word, good, good. This is one of my major announcements. We're going to begin a new series today. Put your hands together to the Lord. You know, the Spirit of God leads us, you know, um, on what to share. And we want to, I just want to introduce that to you. Now, this is supposed to be some very elementary thing of our, of our faith. But I have realized that most Christians don't even know the elementary things. Amen. So, we sort of have this disjointed belief system, you know. That's why sometimes people are not too, you know, established in the faith and are easily swayed by every wind of doctrine. And um, because this year is also a year that we decided that we'll go deep into God, it's important that we revisit foundational teachings, doctrines that are very basic to our faith, such that everybody here will be able to articulate in very clear terms what your faith is. Now, this sort of teaching is meant for like Sunday school digging deep or STS. But we have decided that we want to make it a Sunday service teaching because 
Sadly, quite a number of people don't come for STS. Search the scriptures. And there is little growth that you can experience. There's so much you can experience if you are not coming for Bible study. The Bible says that the word of God's grace is able to do what? To build you up and give you what? An inheritance among them that are sanctified. And if you don't know the word, you'll be in error. In fact, Jesus said, I was praying with my small group prayer team. Hope we have, hope you're in a small group. Um, let me see how many of you are in a small group prayer team for this month. What is this? Raise your hands well. If you are not, just try and join one. Amen. It's just a small, we are, we, we are encouraging small groups, I mean clusters of prayer teams and you know where you pray and study the word for um, the month of April. We are engaging everything that will make us grow. Amen. People have distracted me. Where was I? Before I went there. Sorry? So, the foundational stuff. So, we'll begin today um, based on Hebrews 6. Say Hebrews 6. Let's go there. Hebrews 6 verse 1. And Pastor O.I. will begin the series for us. I'll take next Sunday. And we will be extremely blessed. Also, shortly after this, we'll have what I call the salt series. Say salt series. Let, let's read Hebrews first before we go to... Therefore, let's read together. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal. Now, the Bible calls all of these the principles of the doctrine of Christ. These are basic stuff, but you will be shocked that a lot of people don't even know what these mean. Amen. So we're going to delve into this to, you know, further reinforce our um, foundation in Christ Jesus. And then we'll have what I call the salt series. Say salt series. Salt series. I was having a conversation with my son and then he spoke about salt and I just had like a rhema moment. You know, Jesus says that ye are what? The salt of the earth and ye are what? The light of the world. So, so salt series is simply salt and light teachings. Salt and light teaching series. So that's why it's called salt series. Amen. So we're going to, you know, study this and you know this will help us make our Christianity more impactful. When Jesus speaks about being salt and light he's speaking about being an impactful Christian. So we'll delve into that. Amen. Jesus speaking in I think Matthew 22, 29 I hope I'm right or 29, 22 somebody check if I'm right. He says yes. Jesus answered and said unto them ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. In other words, you are in error because you don't know the scriptures. So Jesus defined in clear terms why and how people get into error. It's simple because you don't know the scriptures. You err. You are in error. That, that word error means you are deceived. You are out of the way. Simply because you don't know the scriptures, and because you don't know the scriptures, you neither know what? The power of God. The word of God is quick and what? Powerful. So, we are going to go so deep in the word in this church that when you ooze out, breathe, you breathe the word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready for the word of God? Yes, oh, why can we go there or can we take celebrations? I think, I think the climate is set for the word. Let's stand and lift our hands. I, I, I said, let's stand. I said, like, oh. <laughs> sit down. He said, Yo, sit down. Everybody sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down. Stand up. 
Sit down. Stand up. Jump up. Shout hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together. Receive the ministry of Pastor O.Y. As she brings us the word. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, bro. Morning, church. How are we doing? Good. Wow. Just going to help me up with a chair. Um, let's just lift our hands to God. Thank you so much. Let's just thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's like Pian just said, the word of God is sharp, it's quick, sharper than a double-edged sword. The word, the person, the word, Jesus, is here this morning. The Holy Spirit has come ahead. He's brooded over the hearts of each and every one of us, whether you're here in person or you're online. He's breathed upon the word of God to make it alive. God, we pray that as your word goes forth, it would do exactly what it says in the scriptures. It will pierce through to the very, you know, the root, the marrow. It will divide and cut all of the fluff aside, it will go to the very root, the very intentions of our hearts, the chambers, the places that we want to hide and we want to hold back. I pray that your word would disarm us this morning, that your word will bring what nothing else upon the surface of the earth can bring forth, the transformation of a man's soul, God, that your word would change. It will make new, God. It will deliver, it will heal, it will set free, God. It will bring liberty, God. That there would be reconciliation, God. That there would be evidence of salvation, God. That there would be evidence of encounter with you, God. It's written in the scriptures that when they saw the disciples, when they saw Peter, John, when they saw them, they said that these were men who had been with Jesus, God. That we would be people who would interact with your word in that way. Not just people who come and we hear the word spoken to us or spoken at us, God Almighty. But people who interact with the word of God. Who do, God Almighty, that rumination. Who chew on the word of God. Who take it in. Who ruminate on it. Who meditate on it. Who process it. Who bring it out again. Who speak it forth, God Almighty. Who let the full... They, we, we, we learn to savor all of the flavors of your word, God Almighty. This is the bread of life, God. God, let your word bring life in this place, God. Let your word bring life, oh God, to the glory of your name. Can we just sing that song, Hallowed Be Your Name? Malabasandia. Above all else, he has exalted his name, his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will remain. Let's just hallow the name of the Lord. If he has exalted these two things, his name and his word, above all else. hallow your name God we hallow your word it's not like any other any other book there are many wise men upon the face of the planet many wise quotes by which we can live our lives by many motivational things but this word has a power like no power thank you the power that raised Christ from the dead hallelujah Salabarandia, hallelujah. Hallowed, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be
Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hopefully I don't fall at some point. Okay. It's like Pastor Nat said, we're starting a new series um, today, and it's exciting. These are the foundations of our Christian faith, as we're going to read about. And I'm just going to look at one of them today. We'll probably have about six Sundays where we'll look at, or maybe we'll do two in a Sunday. But for the next couple of Sundays... We're going to be looking at the six things that Hebrews highlights as um, the elementary things, the foundational things of our faith. The thing that, the things that everyone who ever um, responds to a call to give their life to Jesus Christ ought to know. That is the assumption of Scripture. That is the assumption that um, that Paul was speaking with, and he was saying to them that. You're still at this level, but it was he. It it it's the assumption that if you come into Christ, if somebody was to walk up to you on the street and to say, you know, are you Christian? And you you said yes. You know, I'm born again. The assumption is that these six things are things that are foundational to your faith. They are immovable. They are things that you must, without shadow of a doubt, believe in. That's essentially why we're looking at them. We said that this year is going to be a year of depth, that we're going to go deeper. And um, the best way of starting is to start at the very beginning, um, the very foundation, the very roots. And so this is part of going deeper in the word of God. It's kind of like walking back. Um, and, and reminding ourselves, calling to mind again, what is it that I believe? If someone was to take you aside and to say, explain to me, what is it um, that Christians believe? What is central? Um, because, of course, you know that, for example, that the personality Abraham is not peculiar alone to the Christian faith. We know that, right? Abraham is a feature of the Abrahamic faith. So, you know, there's there's Christian, there's Islam, and there is um, Judaism. They're often referred to as the Abrahamic faiths because each and every one of those faith groups look to Abraham as the forefather or the father of their faith. So it's not enough to believe in Abraham, right? We've got to know that along the way, as we go through history and we make we make a journey through time from the very beginning when man, when God started to interact with humanity and we see him interact then um, after some time with Abraham and he's called our father of the faith. It's not enough to hold on to just that because along the way there are things that have caused these Abrahamic faiths to be distinctly different. Sometimes I come across or I'll speak to a friend who is Muslim um, or for example our family driver and he celebrates all the holidays. I just think he likes days off. So Easter, he didn't come to work. Uh, so I was looking for him when he was coming out. I said, so you're also celebrating Eid. But you are just, you did Easter. You didn't come. We didn't see your, you know, your shadow. So he eats all, uh, in fact, uh, even the strictly prohibited, he's there. As far as he's concerned, they are all one. And I've tried to tell him many times before that they are not one. And often, especially when I meet, you know, um, how should I say, very sort of amiable um, people of the Islamic faith, they'll say, you know, we just call it something different, you know, but it's all one. Or, for example, a, a family like my mother's family that have both, you know, have a high ratio of both, you know, um, Christians and Muslims in it, and they live peacefully side by side. There's intermarriage and all of that. And maybe you come from such a family. You can be mistaken to think that actually they're just the same thing under different names. Um, but it's important that you leave here today knowing that, in fact, they are not at all the same, right? Not at all the same. And a lot of that, in fact, most of it with Judaism and, and Christianity, with Islam and, and Christianity, revolves around this person called Jesus Christ. And once you cannot believe that Jesus Christ 
really existed, was really the son of God or is really the son of God, really did die on the cross, really for your sins, the truth about it is you cannot be Christian. It can be anything else, but you cannot be Christian. It is central to our faith. So we're going to look at some of those sort of home truths, things that are foundational to when you say, I believe in Jesus Christ. So for sake of time, we won't be able to read through um, Hebrews 1 and 4, Hebrews chapter 1 rather, um, to 4. Um, But I want to encourage us because again, this is part of depth to be able to understand something really, really well. It's very important that you understand the context, right? If somebody was to get to know you better, they would need to understand all of the things that have gone before, you know, or a lot of the things that have gone before when they met you just today. They'd, they'd need to know a little bit of your family, where you grew up, you know, what part of the country you come from, what languages you speak, where did you go to school, who are your friends, you know, to be able to get a context of your life so they understand why you are the way you are now, why you are the person that you are now. So that context is very important, but I'll summarize. Hebrews chapter 1 to four, um, pretty much kind of charts, you know, that relationship that um, God was having with, um, with mankind. And it mirrors, it mirrors the relationship that, that God is having with mankind post Jesus Christ. Um, so speaks about things like the temple, speaks about sacrifice, speaks about um, death, speaks about sin, but in the context of how it happened under the old covenant or what is sometimes referred to as Moses or the law, the law, so the Ten Commandments, those things, the, the guide, the laws that God gave to his people to regulate their interaction with him and with themselves um, so that they would really be able to live life um, as abundantly as they could, you know, um, in that dispensation. So that's essentially really what Hebrews 1 and 4 is talking about. Um, How the things that were done, for example, going into the temple, and we're going to get into some of that in more detail, and bringing a sacrifice. You know, we just spoke about sacrifice. Now, there was a time in the earth when it was very commonplace to offer even a slain animal to God, right? And we'll understand why. And we'll see why even now in the kingdom of darkness, darkness, that is still done. Um, It's not done because it has no power whatsoever. It's actually done because it has real weight, you know, in the spirit realm. So Hebrews 1 and 4 gives that context as to why those things were done, but highlights very clearly that they were done just as a shadow. You know, they were done as a, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, Kind of like an example or a metaphor of the things that really were to come. So for example, God says to, to Abraham, when he gives, he gives him his Isaac, his promised child, after many, 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 many decades of waiting, and he tells Isaac, go onto this mountain, you know, and sacrifice your son. And Abraham takes Isaac and he has him bound and he's about to, you know, really go ahead in obedience, just, I guess, believing God um, that if this was the God who was able to give me this child when my body was dead, my wife's body was dead, then surely God can replace the child overnight, you know. Abraham had crazy faith. Um, So takes his child up there to sacrifice and the Lord says, don't go ahead. And the scriptures detail that God says to him, you know, Behold, on the mountain of the Lord, you know what? A lamb will be provided. A sacrifice will be provided. All of what was happening there was was like, how should I say, a poetic demonstration. It was metaphorical of the fact that on the mountain that God actually asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, if he were to stand, you know, in the Holy Land, it, it looks at the mountain on which Jesus Christ actually died. And when God said to Abraham, upon the mount of the Lord, there would be provided a lamb. He was speaking. It was like prophetic speech that one day I will give a sacrificial lamb. Is what I'm saying making sense? So the, the scripture, a lot of the Old Testament is filled with a lot of that um, poetic imagery and poetic sort of 
I'm trying to think of the best word to, to, you know, capture what I'm saying, but metaphorical interaction with the Lord that really only comes into real fulfillment when we come into the New Testament. That is why we say that Christ, the scriptures say, that Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Because everything that the law was speaking about, all of the things that it says, you know, in the Ten Commandments, honor the Lord your God, you know, serve him and him alone, honor your father and your mother, you know, do not take your neighbor's oxen, do not sleep with your neighbor's wife, do not do this. All of those rules and those regulations, all of them, when you come into the New Testament, are summed up with love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Because it was just trying to get them to achieve under the old covenant what really was to find fulfillment in the future. So that is how the two dispensations of the Old Testament and the New Testament work. The Old Testament is just a shadowy, it's like when you're looking, okay, yeah, like for me, you know, if I didn't have my contacts in right now, I, I wouldn't... It is well. I definitely will only see color. I would not even be able to distinguish people from people from where I'm here. I am up here. I would not be able to say, oh, this is laddie down there. Definitely not. Without my glasses. And that's kind of what the Old Testament was like. It was like you're seeing, you know, things are a little bit, God is trying to get them to understand at their realm of understanding. But their eyes were kind of like what I'm like when I don't have my glasses on. But under the New Testament, it's like somebody finally fixes your eyes and you're given good vision and you're able to see clearly, to see God as who he is, to understand your frailty, to understand your brokenness, to see the world for, 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 you know, for the, for the, with the sickness that it has, to understand why God relates with it in the way that he does, to understand why Jesus had to die. So that's really, if I can you know, summarize it are the differences. And that's really what Hebrews 1 to 4 speaks about. So let's read Hebrews 5. That would be good to do um, just to bring a bit more context. And then we'll land in Hebrews 6 and highlight those things. So Hebrews 5, let's do it in the NIV, please. Okay. So it says, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. So to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So Aaron was a high priest, the brother of Moses, and a high priest when, when God gave the law to Moses. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a, was a person in the Old Testament who didn't have, you know, um, remind myself now before I mix him up with Methuselah, um, who had no, no end date, right? Who continued forever. He was a king under, under the Old Testament um, whose reign continued forever, right? So it says he's, he's like that. He is one whose reign, Jesus is one whose reign continues forever. There's no perishing. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Hmm. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. 
You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Hebrews 6 now. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of, one, repentance from acts that lead to death, two, of faith in God, three, instruction about cleansing rites, four, the laying on of hands, five, the resurrection of the dead, six, the eternal judgment. Did we get those six things? Those are the six things. And this morning, we're going to start with the first one, repentance from acts that lead to death. So like I say, these are things that when you sign up to be a Christian, must be things that you unequivocally, no argument, no contention, must believe in. When you say to someone who is not a Christian that you are a Christian, you are making a representation that these are things that you believe in without any form of doubt, without any form of argument, that there must be all of these six things present in your faith. So let's start. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit. So we're going to start with death, right? Repentance from acts that lead to death. So we'll start with death. Where did it begin? If we go back to Adam and Eve, if we go to Genesis 2, um, I'm going to read 15 to 17. And I think from here, media, if you'll help me with the amplified. With the amplified. Not the classic amplified, just the regular amplified or the contemporary one. Okay, so Genesis 2 um, and verse 15. Okay, it says, so the Lord God took the man, this is after he's created the heavens and the earth, the fish, the stars, the sea, he has made day, he has made night, he's made the waters, he's made all of that. He makes man, right? It says that the Lord God took the man he had made and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may freely unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden but only from the tree of the knowledge that is the recognition of good and evil you shall not eat otherwise on the day that you eat from it you shall most certainly die because of your disobedience um let's go to genesis 3 thank you lord So Genesis 3, um, after that time that God had instructed Adam, it then says that God said to himself, you know what, it's not good for man to be alone. And then he put, you know, Adam into a deep sleep and he created a woman from the rib of Adam. And Adam saw him and was like, oh, ma, fine, babe, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Um, and that was his wife, Eve. So it says, verse three, um, chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty subtle, skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said that you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Did you see that? That's subtle, skillful deception. God had clearly said you may freely eat unconditionally of any tree, just this one tree you shall not eat from. But Satan comes along, and this is how temptation goes for any, every one of us. And he just, he tweaks it a little bit. You know, we live in a generation now where there's so many different versions of the truth. Some people say, no problem, if that's true for you, you know, that's your truth, babes. Just live your truth. I'll live my truth. But according to God, there is only one truth, right? Because the moment that you add 1% of non-truth into the truth, it has ceased to be the truth, right? It's like if you put a, if you put a glass of water here 
and you were just to put 1% of poison in it, just 1%, guess what? The water is no longer safe for drinking. Do you agree? Or would you risk it? Now, some people might risk it just thinking, I'm sure it's fine until it's 50% poison. I'm sure any right-thinking individual wouldn't do that. But right-thinking individuals all across the earth right now have said that if you introduce 99% lie into the truth, it's still the truth. It absolutely cannot be. So the enemy comes along and he just wants to tweak what God has said. But did he really say you can't eat from any, which is the complete opposite of what God said? And she says to him, verse 2, And the woman said, We may eat from the, from the fruit of the trees of the garden. Let's keep going. Except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. So she was smart enough to respond with the actual truth. God said, You shall not eat from it, nor touch it, otherwise you will die. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. You know, it's like when people say, don't do too much. You are doing too much. Are you the only one that killed Jesus? Verse 5. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. That is, you will have greater awareness and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delightful to look at, and he still continues to do that, you know, it's the industry of, of cosmetics. It is making everything look amazing. You know, we, that is our generation now where we don't really care for the substance as long as the packaging is good. You know, we don't realize the impact that it's having on our souls because we're so taken away by the aesthetics of what is happening. It says that when she saw that it was good for food and that it was delightful to look at a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful. So all of a sudden she began to crave more knowledge, you know, to feel deep, you know, when she speaks to people that they'd be like, oh, wow. She took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some of it to her husband with her and he ate Then the eyes of the two of them were opened, that is, their awareness increased, and they knew that they were naked, and they fastened fig leaves together. This was, they were the first tailors upon the earth, and hopefully it fits, you know? And they knew they were naked, and they fastened fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the, sounds of, the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the, in the cool afternoon breeze of the day. So the man and his wife hid and kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Verse 10, he said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Nobody's, na- nobody's afraid to hide themselves naked these days. Mm. <laughs> 11, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten fruit from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who you gave to me to be, to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. This was the beginning of certain men shirking all responsibility. And the man said, is this the next verse? Okay, yeah, 13, thank you. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled and deceived me and I ate from the beginning tree. So everybody's blaming everybody else. 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, the serpent did not have anybody to <laughs> Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, open hostility between you and the woman and between your seed, her offspring, and her seed. And, you shall fa- and he shall fatally bruise your head, and you shall only bruise his heel. Let's pause on that verse. Genesis 15. 
I said at the beginning that the Old Testament, a lot of the things that we read are pro, are like poetic prophecy about things that will come before. As you can see where the scripture here is speaking about her seed, seed for her is in capital S, right? And it goes on to say, he in capital H will bruise your head and you shall only bruise capital H, his heel. It is speaking not of just your offspring, aka every child that comes from a, a woman's body, but is speaking actually about the Savior. You know that in the scripture, when it refers to Jesus, it puts him in capital H, just the way there are many gods, right? God doesn't deny there are many gods upon the earth. In fact, God has said to humans that he created in his image, he says that ye are gods, right? Small letter G. When we, when we refer to God, the Alpha, the Omega, that is capital letter G, just to distinguish it so there is no confusion. So we have here in this scripture, capital S, her seed, speaking about one who will come, that that one will crush the head of Satan, will bruise his head, and that Satan will only bruise his heel. Okay, let's go. 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in giving childbirth. And in pain, you will give birth to children. Yet your desire and your longing will be for your husband. And he will rule with authority over you and be responsible for you. 17. Then to Adam, the Lord God said, because you have listened attentively to the voice of your wife. It doesn't mean you should not listen to your wife. Mm. And have eaten fruit from the tree about which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it the ground is now under a curse because of you in sorrow and toil you shall eat the fruit of it all the days of your life but thorns and thistles it will grow for you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you will eat until you return to the ground for from it you were taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The, na- the man named his wife Eve, meaning life spring, life giver, because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made tunics of animal skins for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and evil. Now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruit and live in this fallen, sinful condition forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent Adam away from the Garden of Eden to till and cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So God drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he permanently stationed the cherubim, which an angel, with a sword with a flashing blade, which turned round and round in every direction to protect and to guard the way, the entrance, and the access to the tree of life. We'll come back to that a little later on. So... When God speaks, right, you know, we say that, we, we say that, we echo the scriptures that say that God's ways are not our ways, right? And his thoughts are above our thoughts. We see in the scripture that when God speaks and he says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, he doesn't necessarily mean it the way we mean A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Okay, so in the same way that at the very beginning, God said, let there be light. Before there, were any, there was any humans on the earth, let there be light. The spirit of God that is within God, right? Romans tells us that only the spirit that is within a man can know what that man thinks. In the same way, the spirit of God that is in God searches the understanding of God and brings forth what God means, Right? So when God said, let there be light, the Holy Spirit knew and from brooding over the earth went forth the word, Jesus went forth and light was formed. God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Before that, there had been no death. They had no idea to how to even wrap. I mean, we've lived, there's been a lot of life upon the earth since we were born. And so now when people say you will die, we kind of understand, oh, somebody is going to cease living. Are we together? But that was not necessarily what God meant when he said, you will surely die. Because as we see, they ate the fruit, but they did not fall dead. Are we together? 
So the way in which we interact with God when God speaks, right, it's always, I guess, just as a footnote for all of us to ask what he really means by this. Sometimes people have dreams and visions and they think that maybe they saw this in the dream and they saw that in the vision and they interpret it with their literal fleshly understanding without ever asking God, what is it that you are trying to show me? Because when God says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, he may not mean it in the way of your limited understanding. He may mean it on a much higher frequency than what you understand. There there had never even been a death. So they didn't even understand that it was possible for someone to fall down and die. They risked the ultimate thing. They had no idea what it really meant for someone to die. And what God was referring to there was, was something on a much higher frequency than someone falling down and dying. But that in the day that you eat of it, there will be spiritual death for you. And we begin to see that straight away. As we've just read, the moment that they ate it, something entered in. They suddenly had this awareness. And with that awareness came one of the symptoms of death that we're going to look at. There are many symptoms of sin that brought death. And we can't look at them all. So I think I've highlighted just two that we're going to look at. We'll look at fear. But before I come to that, I'll address chronology have written my notes he spoke about death on a more on a on a much higher frequency than a physical death but for sure physical death also came into the picture shortly after this right genesis 4 if we were to look at that 6 to 16 we see that the next generation after adam and eve cain and abel their children were the first to commit murder So we saw Cain kill his brother Abel, and he had no sort of remorse for it. We saw already that he was beginning to deal with the symptoms of sin. If we go to that scripture from, we can't read it all, from 6 to 16. They were supposed to bring God a sacrifice. Some of us who've been in church a while know the story. And it says that Abel went and he took from the firstborn, you know, of his cattle. He took a blemish free, you know, cattle from his flock and he offered it as a sacrifice. And Cain, who is even the hunter, just went and he brought God any other, any, you know, he just, he just came and he squeezed and just gave God his offering in any kind of disregarding manner. And God says to Cain, when when he rejected his sacrifice, but he accepted the sacrifice of Abel. He said, why are you angry about the fact that I've rejected your sacrifice? We begin to see that, that that disregard for God, that disobedience for God, that pride against God, that questioning against God, how dare you reject my sacrifice, already started to come in from the next generation. It flowed from Adam and Eve into their children. I'm sure they didn't teach their children rebellion. Just the same way nobody teaches young children little things that they do. But you see, even from when they're babies, when they're children, you know, there's that, the the famous, they take your meat from the pot and they go and hide and eat it in secret. Nobody told them you can't eat the meat in open. But there's something within them, is what I'm saying making sense. Nobody has to teach them. Sin is like, is like it is sickness that just flows in the bloodline. There is just that tendency to do wrong. And God said to, a, to Cain very clearly, he says, sin is crouching at your door, just waiting for you. And its desire is to master you. But you must resist it. You must master it. That was all the way back then. But he decides to disregard what God says, and he kills his brother. No remorse whatsoever. It takes a lot of mind to do that. It takes a certain kind of heart disposition to do that. And Cain did it, and he had no remorse. And God said to him, where's your brother? And he asked God, very rude. Am I my brother's keeper? Why are you asking me? Your eyes no open. I ain't no good. Can't see. And God had to say, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Blood speaks. Pastor Nat just said that. People offer sacrifice today 
Because blood speaks, it has a voice. The kingdom of darkness knows that it has a voice. That's why they slaughtered that animal on Third Mainland Bridge to be able to secure their lives while they worked on the bridge. But you never make a deal with the enemy and he's straight with you. As we read, the serpent was more cunning than any other. Satan there. So he tells people, no problem now, slay this animal. While you work on the bridge, nobody will die. What he doesn't tell you is that but somebody will surely die. It may not be you, but somebody will die. Because that's how the enemy makes his deals. It is always deceitful. Always deceitful. So physical death came. And all of a sudden, it was possible to actually physically fall down and die. But God had meant that beyond even that, spiritual death would come upon you. And we're going to look at the first thing that came in. That fear. The scripture says that as soon as Adam and Eve had did it, they suddenly realized. These were people who had been naked all this time and were living their lives jolly, naked, naked. But the moment that they fell into sin, suddenly they were ashamed even amongst themselves, even as husband and wife. And they hid from the presence of God. And that is a symptom of spiritual death. It's a symptom of sin. It, fear is something that has come in as a result of sin being in the world. Many different kinds of fear. Adam and Eve hid. If we journey through and we go to the time of Moses, we see there was this man, Moses, who interacted with God. God says of him that he's faithful in all my house. That I don't, nobody can see the face of God, but this man has seen my glory. Meaning that it was possible to have a relationship with God like that. Moses didn't come from a Christian background, right? He didn't even come from, he was lineage, right? An Israelite or a Jew. But he didn't grow up with that. He grew up, even the name Moses is not a Hebrew name. It's an Egyptian name. He had the name that was given to him by Pharaoh's daughter who raised him, right, as mother. He had Egyptian culture, which is a very idolatrous, a very actually satanic culture. It's actually a very serpentine religion. But one day in the wilderness, this man encounters God in a burning bush. Even Abraham, the father of the faith, he didn't grow up in a Christian family. You know, sometimes we make these excuses for ourselves. That the reason we don't know God as much as another person is that, no, my parents did not take me to Sunday school. I didn't grow up in that kind of family. But people who walked with God in amazing ways, like Abraham and Moses, show that you don't have to grow up in a Christian family. That if really you do as the scripture says, if you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will surely be found by him. And he saw this thing and he's wondering, why is this tree on fire and it's not burning? And he was curious. And I say to each and every one of us today that if you simply will go to God with curiosity, you may not be able to read the Bible from cover to cover in 2024. You may never have been taken to Sunday school with your parents. Maybe your dad is an Ifa priest. Maybe your mother is something in, in, in one ocean river. It actually doesn't matter. If you go to God with a little bit of curiosity the way Moses did, there is no limitation upon your life. There is no barrier that you can walk with God. Is what I'm saying making sense? And Moses, this person who had come from this Egyptian religion, encounters God and walks with God so much that God says of him, nobody else on the face of the planet is like this man. He's meeker, more humble than anybody on the planet. But the rest of the children of Israel, God gave them the opportunity to know him in the same way. We are all given the same opportunity. We can all know God the way Daddy Adeboye knows God. Whoever it is who is your, your, your inspiration in the Christian faith, maybe it's Pastor Nat, maybe it's Benson Idahosa, maybe it's Benny Hinn. Whoever it is, 
you can know God in the same way that they knew God. And they had this opportunity, the children of Israel. But they saw certain aspects of God. And again, this fear that came in through sin and came in through death. And they saw the thunder and they saw the smoke and the cloud on the mountain. And they said, no problem, Moses, you just talk to God. Come and deliver his message after. And many of us as Christians, which is why this series is so important. Many of us, because of maybe the discipline it's going to take to know God. You mean I really wake up at night and pray? You mean I really have to read the book of Leviticus? God, you mean I'll read Obadiah? You mean I really have to do? You mean I'll fast? You mean I... And so you just stay at the frequency of your comfort. That was what the children of Israel chose to do. To stay at the frequency of their comfort. And a lot of people's comfort zone is actually their killer. The comfort zone is the zone in which a lot of destinies die. Because what it takes to simply, Paul writes in, um, what book is it? In 1 Corinthians, I believe chapter 9. He says that I don't beat like a man just beating the air. I'm not just boxing in vain. But I buffet my body and I make it my slave. I put certain disciplines in my life. I put certain rigidities. I have a certain consecration. Pastor Nat says that, all the time. I have a certain consecration so that after I preach to men, I myself will not be a castaway. Definitely, there are certain things to be put into place to be able to walk with God and know God so that this sickness that runs in the bloodline, this sin that seems to be affecting all of humanity, this thing that leads to death, physical, but on a much higher frequency, doesn't have to master me. This thing that God warned Cain about, that is crouching at his door and crouching at the door of every human being, doesn't master me. There are definitely certain protocols that I must put into place so that the things that have come in through death don't reign and have rule over my life. The people had fear. Fear of many different things. If we read through, read through Joshua, read through Isaiah, read through the Psalms, there's so many times that God has to say to people, do not fear. To Joshua alone, because he had big shoes to fill. His predecessor was the one that God has said, nobody has walked with me like this. And all of a sudden, you are the second in command. And God says to Joshua, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. These are big shoes. Believe I'm with you. Do not fear. Moses says to Joshua, do not fear. It got to the point where obviously the people were looking at him and his face was not encouraging. The people say, don't fear, be encouraged. They had to be encouraging him. Because all of a sudden when this thing, this sin, this sickness came in, It became almost second nature for humanity to be afraid. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, I will fear no evil. There's a fear even if if each and every one of us are honest, there are fear of things. Fear that you will get a doctor's report. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the future. Fear of juju. Fear of the people in the village. Yeah, fear of your boss saying a certain thing. Fear you fail your exam. Fear that you cannot do what the Lord has asked you to do. Fear that you never marry. Fear there's a pattern in your family. Fear the fear, the fear, the fear in many different ways. The scripture even says that there are people who have a fear that they're going to die. They live with that fear that, and they're in bondage to it. Hebrews 2 and verse 15. It says that Jesus Christ came, (coughs) pardon me, that he might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery throughout their lives. A whole myriad of fear that was on the people of God. And even now, fear that's on the people of God. But Jesus Christ came, that that fear that came in Attached itself straight away to Adam and Eve, that they feared the presence of God. 
And when you know you have done something on Saturday night, you don't want to go to church on Sunday morning. You have a fear of the presence of God. That maybe when you even make it in into the congregation on Sunday morning and you lift your hands and you want to worship, there is that fear that takes on a voice and accuses you. The Bible calls it the accuser of the brethren. And suddenly you feel that God could never want to hear from you. God will never want a relationship with you. Are we together? Fear came in. It was one of the symptoms of death that began to mark humanity the moment death came in. The second thing was a limitation. An inability to do things in the way that God had first given man ability to do them. Even a limitation on the length of life. If we look at Genesis 6, for sake of time, we'll not be able to read it. But if you read through the scripture, you will see that the length of days of men has reduced as time has gone on. So once upon a time, you would see that men would live to 736, 800 and this, 905, 700 and this. And sometimes you think... Maybe they were calculating it differently that time. They really weren't. They really weren't. When it says that this and this person had a child at the age of 103, they really did. Because such things are possible with God. And that's for somebody who is believing their biological clock is running out. Such things are possible with God. It was when sin and death entered in that that limitation began to encroach upon man. Indeed, in Genesis 6, God himself says that, you know what? My spirit is not going to continue to strive with the spirit of man. No, he's just a mortal. I'm going to have to limit his days. Because there's so much corruption, and we're going to come to that. There was so much corruption upon the face of the earth. Genesis 6, 11 to 13. In the Amplified, it says that the population of the earth was corrupt absolutely depraved, spiritually and morally putrid. It means that it was festering, decaying in God's sight. And the land was filled with violence, desecration, infringement, outrage, assault, and lust for power. God looked on the earth and saw how debased and degenerate it was. For all humanity had corrupted their way on the earth and lost their true direction. And so God said to Noah, and before this it says that again, God found this one man in this generation. It says that Noah was a righteous man and he was faithful in God's sight. And so God said to Noah, I intend to make an end of all that lives, both human and animal. For through men, the land is filled with violence. And behold, I am about to destroy them together with the land. As we know, God, God gave Noah an instruction to make an ark. And he and his family entered it with the male and female of every, every, every living animal that was upon the, uh, upon the face of the earth. And they went in. We sing that song. The animals went in two by two. Hurrah, hurrah. And they went in, male and female, so that after the flood, they might be able to populate again. That was what God had to do. It was, it was again, how shall I say, it was damage control. When Adam and Eve did what they did in the Garden of Eden, God had to come up with damage control. He had to put a distance between them and the tree of life, like we read, so that they wouldn't live forever in that fallen state. And then he put that angel there with the sword to guard the tree of life. It was his damage control. In Noah, there had to be damage control for what the children, what, the, what humans had done upon the face of the planet. And then God began to repopulate the earth again. Limitation came in. We saw that women began to die in childbirth. There were sins upon the earth. If we read through Deuteronomy, we see these laws that God gave them about things that were an abomination. You shall not lay with your father's sister. 
You shall not lay with your close relations. It is an abomination because there was so much corruption. There was incest. There was perversion. There were things. There, were, there was depravity all over the earth. There was wickedness. There was theft. There was rape. There was every grotesque and evil thing that we can think about. All of this came in with sin. And all of these led to spiritual death even before they led to physical death. People were sacrificing their children. Leviticus 18 verse 21. Sacrificing their children to, to Molech. And they would put their children through fire as a form of sacrifice to this God. All forms of wicked idolatry. If you go to the, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Angels came into a place. And the men of that town wanted to sleep with angels. There was a, there was a man of God in another place. And the men, the men in that town took, took his, his, concubine, his, his wife or his concubine and they, they so desecrated her that the next day he chopped up her body and he sent it to all of the tribes there to see the level of depravity of what had gone on. People did things that their consciences didn't feel any sort of way about. And all of this was happening in the sight of a God who has said that he is holy and his eyes cannot behold sin. And all of this is leading us to why we have come to the place and to the era of repentance. What is repentance? Because like I said, we see even with Adam and Eve, with Cain and Abel, because when Cain slew his brother, God cursed him. And he said to God, this curse is too much for me to bear. And even with the murderer, God placed a sign on his head so that nobody would kill him. God put parameters in his life. We see with Cain and Abel, with Adam and Eve, with Noah's generation, with Moses' generation, that there's just something about man. There is something that God feels about man. I've heard people say that man, you know, human beings, we have, you know, and not to be rude or to be disrespectful, I've heard it say like almost like God's mumu button. That there is a certain way, Psalm, Psalm 8, is it Psalm 8, verse 4 and 6, ask the question that, who is man that you are mindful of him? Because throughout the scriptures, we see like even when man makes the worst of blunders, and this should be an encouragement for everyone, even when men make the worst of blunders, the nature of the God there we are dealing with is that even when he is angry, scripture tells us that he's angry for a moment, but his mercy, what, is for many generations. That there's so much, he's already thinking, even within his anger, he's thinking about the damage control that he wants to do to be able to preserve your life. He's thinking about what mechanism, what measure, what thing he can put into place that will mean it such that we are not con totally destroyed. That there is a love, there is a feeling, there is a sentiment, there is a bond, there is a union, there is something that God feels for humanity that means that even when we are deserving of the worst form of death, when we are deserving of eternal damnation, when we are deserving of hell, when we are deserving of separation for him, from, from him forever, that God is always trying to find a way where there seems to be no way. Are we still together? This is the nature of the God that we serve. And that is why repentance and the era of repentance is so important. What is repentance? Under the Old Testament, I would say that this era of repentance that we're in right now was preceded by atonement, by atonement. We can't go back in for sake of time. But Hebrews 9, if we can read from verse 1, under the Old Testament, we would, there would be a situation where God had created the temple, right? 
and there was the outer court and there was the inner court. We read about high priests at the beginning. There was the outer court, there was the inner court, and then there was the Holy of Holies. And that Holy of Holies had the Ark of the Covenant. And within the Ark of the Covenant, that was where God, you know, would would put his presence. A limitless God would put his presence in this place called the Ark of the Covenant. And so it was possible for people to be able to access the outer courts. Some people even the inner court. But that holy of holies, under the Old Testament, that was reserved for the high priest. We read that at the beginning, that the high priest goes in. Again, speaking poetically, it was speaking about what was to come. What Jesus would come and would fulfill. The high priest back then, there was only one high priest at any given time. You could have many priests, but you could only have one high priest. And he would go and he would make atonements. There would be a day of atonement. And everybody would bring their sacrifice. You will bring a blemish-free lamb. You will bring the best of your best. Because hopefully you would remember your ancestor king bringing the worst of his worst. So you would bring your best of the best to offer to God a sacrifice that would be acceptable in his sight. And they would bring it and the high priest would, you know, he he would have to go through this meticulous way of dividing the animals depending on what animal it was. Because all of their parts had a significance. And the blood he would sprinkle, call the blood of sprinkle, he would sprinkle it on the doorposts of the temple because that had a significance. And then there would be the burning of the sacrifice when God was pleased. He would take certain things into the Holy of Holies, only him. And even then when he did it, he had this thing that was tied around his waist that had like bells and things that made noise. And it had a long rope that was attached to it that went all the way outside into the outer court. And so as he made his way around offering the sacrifices of the people, making atonement for their sins on the day of atonement, if any one of them would, would stop hearing the bells... They will know that um, uh, even high priest, ah, ah, he has fallen all our hand. Yeah. And I'm sure it will cause widespread panic because what are they to do? The high priest has obviously made a mistake that has meant that in the presence of the Lord, he has fallen dead. This is the God that we are interacting. You know, now we're so casual with God. We're so casual with God. But back then, We're talking about really the geo of the geos went into the Holy of Holies. And if it is possible for you to comprehend that the geo of geos did something wrong, so wrong that he fell instantly dead, then they will use the rope and they'll drag him out because ain't nobody trying to go in after that. Then they will drag him out. Guys, if you read the Old Testament, you thank God you are born in 20, you thank God you are born now. Distress? Oh. Now you're wondering the offering you are giving back, then you give first fruit, you give your offering, you give your first wave, you give your last wave, you give your in-between wave, you, the offerings, helele. All the different things. But guess what? Even then, All of it is prophetic speech, just poetic prophetic speech about Romans 12. Come and give your life as a living sacrifice. This is what Jesus has done. It's like he summarized the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of everything that the Ten Commandments were. Everything. Look at the stress of all the prophets. God will say, you have even killed your prophets. You are a perverse generation. Who did I know? Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the ayahs. They killed all of them. Jeremiah alone, or was it Joel? I can't remember one. Lay down on one side. This is just... I say, even to be a pastor now, you have to thank God you are under this dispensation. Moses, the perfect man who walked before God, faithful in all his house, a humble man. They provoked him such that he did not enter the promised land. 
Yeah, no, this is the kind of humanity God is dealing with. I feel for Moses, truly. I just think he is just so great that the Bible even speaks about before Jesus will return, he will send what? A form of Elijah and Moses. It's there. These are men who walked with God in incredible ways. Blameless man, humble, but they managed to provoke him. God said, strike it once. He said... Thank you. No, I know when I go home, my husband is going to be, I tell you, you are too dramatic. <laughs> Thank you. He's actually the more dramatic one between both of us. This is our perennial argument. You are more dramatic than me. No, you are more dramatic than me. So this is going to prove his point that I'm more dramatic than him. This was the issue that they were dealing with. There was one prophet that lay on his side over 1,000 days. Just trying to beg God for the people, for their sins, for the corruption. And after those days, he now turned to his other side. (laughs) God. (laughs) This is the level of terrible deeds, the level of sin and wickedness that was on the surface of the planet. God made a way where there seemed to be no way. Hebrews 9 talks about that that Jesus Christ came and once and for all Hebrews 9 says that from the time of Adam to Moses and even there death reigned throughout that time but here we see Jesus Christ come in and he pays remember we talked about that when we looked at Abraham and Isaac going to sacrifice his son and God says to him stop For behold, on the mountain of the Lord, yes, a lamb will be provided. A sacrifice will be provided. And Jesus Christ was that sacrifice. And at the appointed time, he came. And we read at the beginning that even while he lived, he suffered. Son though he was, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. Because the scriptures speak about if he must be, because every high priest is taken from amongst his people. So God had to do it such that Jesus Christ had to come as a man because he must be taken from amongst his brethren. Are we together? Yeah. He must be able to say that I know what it is to live their life. I know what it is to have this sort of weak disposition where like Paul writes, your spirit may be willing, but your flesh is weak. So he came like that. Isaiah tells us that he wasn't, he was a man of many sorrows. This is even before getting to the cross. He was acquainted with affliction. What is it you're going through? What is it your diagnosis? Before he even went to, to, to the house of Caiaphas or whatever, before they had even lashed him, the Bible says his face was not nice to look at. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and with sickness. His life was not easy. His life was not easy. First of all, imagine the whispers around him. Now that one, his mama said, God impregnate him. Yeah, because best believe not everybody would have bought Mary's story. What are the names that you have been called because of the circumstances around your birth? These are all the things that Jesus Christ went through so that he could be your high priest. So that he could say, no, I really know what it is to live your life. So when I say be holy for I am holy, I'm saying it because I know that I have lived this life. And I have gifted to you something that will enable you to live holy. Yes, that's what he's saying. Because it would be unfair for God to tell us to do a thing that he doesn't understand. So he came to understand it. High priest, he learns by obedience. And then he came and he died our death. And he was the high priest who just like that high priest under the Old Testament, his blood went into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God 
was, where the presence of God is. The scriptures tell us this, that the blood is poured out upon the mercy seat in heaven and it speaks for us, what? Better things. Better things than what? Than those poetic, prophetic things of before. Better things than the blood of rams that they gave then. Better things than the blood of goats that they gave then. Better things than the blood of innocence as the blood of Abel that was shed then. Are you seeing how all of it is tying together? All of it connected. We are dealing with one and the same God who throughout humanity, throughout history is trying to bring a people close to say there is a way in which you can know. You don't understand there is a relationship we can have. Your mind cannot fathom it. He's trying to take out everything. We are going to repenting from acts that lead to death. Because the people who live that sort of life, who repent from acts that lead to death, is because they realize that those acts are not worth it. They're not worth it. Back then, some people didn't do it because if they were caught in it, they would have been stoned. Because they would have brought shame to their families. Because this would have happened, that would have happened. Because they would have been separated. Maybe they wouldn't have been able to give evening sacrifice with people. Maybe because they would have been outside of the congregation and they tell them, stay outside. Like Miriam, when she spoke against her brother and God made her skin leprous. No, God had to tell um, um, Moses when he was appealing for her. He said, if her father spits in her face, she'll be outside the camp for seven days. Let her go and wait there. And so that's what she had to do. Until it was atoned for. And then she came back in. These are all the different things. If you think you're dealing with shame now. If you're you're thinking that you're dealing with some sort of societal pressure now. Societal stigma. Not like anything under the Old Testament. No, 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 no. Jesus has made, oh, he has made it so beautiful for us. He has made it so beautiful for us. So easy to be able to access relationship with God. Let's read verse 22 and 9. Verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 9. The Bible says that almost all things by the law are purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. It means that without, let's have it in the amplified. Thank you. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, neither release from sin and its guilt, nor cancellation of the unmerited punishment. And that was why Jesus' blood was required. Many people think, you know, sometimes when you're in conversation, again, if you're ever evangelizing to someone who is Muslim, they're like, how can God die? That is why they, cannot, they can't get that Jesus Christ is God. They're like, your God died. Then he must not be God. But the scriptures say it was necessary for him to die. Yes, so that he will live your life and die your death. These are things that you must understand. They are the elemental foundations of your faith. So if ever someone was to say to you, how can your God be God when your God died? You can explain to them why your God had to die. Are we together? He had to die because he has to live the fullness of the human experience. And then he had to go and descend into darkness. And that thing that Adam and Eve gave up, that authority, that dominion that they were given over all the birds of the air, the this, the that. And then they went and they took counsel from one they were given dominion over. Yeah, he had to go and collect those keys. The keys of dominion and the keys to life and death. When he rose and he saw the disciples, he says, behold, Matthew 19, I believe, I have the keys to life and to death. Therefore, go into all the earth. Preach the good news. Yes, because now I have, I have completed all things. I have really become the fulfillment of the law and the prophet. You are restored back to that place, that place with God that Adam and Eve yielded up in their carelessness. That is what Jesus Christ did. 
So that is how atonement under the Old Testament connects with repentance under the New Testament. What is repentance? Because sometimes even within the Christian faith, it's possible for people to not understand really what repentance is. And the, the root word of that word, repent, is the, is the word shove. Let me read it for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The biblical meaning of the Hebrew word to repent, shove, is to turn and go a different direction. In the Greek, the term is metanoin, meaning to change one's mindset. I said that even in the Christian faith, sometimes when people say they've repented, what they mean is that they've confessed. Right? Right? And certain structures may even be put in place for people to be able to confess. But when you confess your sins, it doesn't mean that you have repented. But it is a sign that you are on the road to repentance. Are we together? It's not enough to come and to... The Bible encourages it. Confession is good. The scriptures say, confess your sins one to another. Yes, that you might be healed. Because what confession does is that it brings it out of the darkness. Because when things are in the darkness, they retain a certain power. When things are in secrecy, they have a certain power over the person who is not... You know, those things that you are ashamed to say to anyone, it has a power over you. You feel so ashamed. You hide yourself from people. You hide yourself from God. You're not able to move forward. There's a certain stagnancy that it keeps you in. There's a condemnation that continues to happen because that thing is in the dark. It has power. The moment you're able to bring it into the light, you deprive it of the influence that it can have over you. But it doesn't end there. Because if that was the case, we'll just be confessing every day, every day, every day. Jesus will come and he will just go into the temple and say, I confess for all of them. But it's not about confession. It doesn't just stop at confessing. You must shove. When the disciples went into the Decapolis, the 10 cities, and God sent them to go and preach this message that he had been raising and training them about. They went, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What he was saying to them is, turn your direction. It means that if you're facing this way, do a 180 and begin to face the other direction. The Greek says, change your mindsets. The book of Romans echoes it, that we are renewed in our mindset by the word of God. When we repent, what we are saying is that this thing, I will do it no more. And I've made a commitment to walk in the opposite direction. So you don't repent and stay in the same location mentally, emotionally, spiritually, even friendship-wise. Is what I'm saying making sense? Because that environment, the scriptures say that if your right hand will cause you to sin, you should cut it off. It's very, very specific about what you're supposed to do. It doesn't say that you should tape it with masking tape behind your back. What it's saying is that take the most extreme step possible to separate yourself from this thing that will lead to death. If your left eye will cause you to sin, gouge it out. This is not now under the news so that next week some people will not be missing some body parts. No, we're not doing that anymore because like we say, Jesus has fulfilled that. But what it means is that you take the principle behind it because all of that was a shadow. It was the poetic to help them then. But now because of what Jesus has done, take the principle. And if your friends, your group of friends will cause you to sin, you cut them off. If your phone will cause you to access a website that you shouldn't access, get the phone that doesn't browse until you can handle the phone that browses. Am I communicating? Don't subscribe 100 gigabytes. Subscribe 10 megabytes. Let it just send hi. Yeah. So that it's not carrying video you shouldn't see. Yeah, that is what the scripture is saying. That you pay any cost 
any price because the ultimate price has been paid. And because it has now been made easy for you, what you must do is now in honor of what has been done. Like I said, back then they did, for many different, nobody wants to be stoned. Nobody wants to be latched because for some things they will say, lash the person 39 times. But God will say, don't lash them more than 39 times because it will cause your brother to be degraded in your eyes. Yeah, because God knows by the time you are lashing someone 55 times, you are not even seeing them as a human being anymore. Are we together? So there was certain punishment for certain crimes. But now because Jesus has paid it all, borrowed the principle, and in honor of what he has done, when you say you repent, you go beyond confession. You come to God, you confess your sins. He already knows. So just be candid. Tell him, I've done this and that. Tell him, I'm struggling with this and that. Tell him, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Tell him like Isaiah when you are encountering him that woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. First John talks about if we say we have no sin, that we make God a liar. What you're saying is that God is accusing you falsely. We must be people who are able to bring our sin to God. And to know that when we, when we do that, they are covered by the blood. The blood then begins to speak for us better things. Better things than the voice of the accuser. Better things than other sacrifices that have been poured on family altars in certain places. Things that would have made you go in that same pattern. The blood can speak for you because with your life, you disrupt the pattern. Is what I'm saying making sense? If everyone in your family, like Pastor has shared before, had a child outside of wedlock before they then got married, you have to disrupt that pattern with a pattern in your life. What it means is that too many people were hanging around patterns and situations that lead them to fall into that sin. So what you must put into your life in honor, this is the life of repentance, in honor of what Jesus Christ has done is a new pattern that makes it such that you flee the very appearance of evil. That like the scripture says, you walk circumspectly. You walk in a manner worthy of the gospel so that your life can take on a new pattern. It means that if the train normally goes choo, 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 choo in this direction and it always meets that destination, that if you want to go here, you must put into practice, like we read there. Let's go back to that scripture, Hebrews 5, at the end. Paul writes to them, he says that you are no longer trying to understand. That this strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use, what they exercise a certain strength. They go to, they use the word of God. It is their gym. And the scripture says that. It says that physical discipline, physical exercise is profitable. That spiritual exercise is much more profitable. It's good to go to the gym because guess what? Your body, not your soul, not your mind, and not your spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So how you treat your body matters. How you eat matters. How we exercise, it matters. That your body can do the length of days that is assigned to your destiny matters. If your destiny requires 80 years and you do your body anyhow and it only lives 69 years, you've been unfaithful with your body. So those years that you miss out on when you meet the Lord early, God forbid, we won't meet the Lord early. But they ought not to have happened is what I'm saying making sense. All of these things, they matter. We bring our whole lives in repentance. Now, I want to make this distinction because I remember probably maybe even with me, and I've seen it even while we've pastored here at the Oasis. When you come to the Lord, let's say an altar call is made at church, like it will be made after after the word, and you come and you give your life to the Lord, and you say, God... I know I'm a sinner. I've walked in a manner unworthy. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your blood. Adopt me as your child. I want to belong to you. Be my savior and be my Lord. And you make that decision. And let's say you make it on January the 7th. And then you come back on January 14th. 
Then you come back January 21st. Then you come back January 28th. Definitely, I'll be looking at personal like something's going on here. And many times it's because the person is not understanding. Right? They have, made, they have come into Christ. Not every time they fall will require that altar call. Are we together? But it will require a lifestyle of repentance. What you're simply saying is sorry. It's like relationship management. You go into covenant with God the same way, for example, management, uh, marriage is a covenant. Baz and I are married. If I hurt him, I should say sorry. He shouldn't, he, I shouldn't take it for granted that I told him I love you on our wedding day. I don't have to say sorry. Is what I'm saying making sense. That's the reason why we repent. Because you acknowledge that this one you love, the, the scriptures talk about grieving the Holy Spirit. There are things that hurt the heart of God. There are things that are not pleasing in his sight. There are things that will make him feel like, ah, after all my sacrifice. Imagine if Baz is working hard, he's providing for our family, and every day I'm picking on him. Every day there's just something that he's doing wrong. Every day he just feels like, I just tell him that it's not enough. Everything you're bringing is just this, it is that, it is that. The Bible says it's even better to live open, just go and live in the open elements than live with that sort of person. And I heard him, and I never even bothered to say sorry. I just say, hey, but didn't I tell you I love you when we got married? And it shouldn't be enough for you. That is how a lot of us want to live our lives with God. And then when I came, I gave my life to Christ. What again? But repenting from acts that lead to death is acknowledging that it is possible to hurt this one that you say that you love. And that you don't even want to do that. So we live lives that manage our relationship, that facilitate the relationship so it can continue to be sweet. That is simply what we're saying. Many people will tell you, even within Christianity, that once saved, always saved. When I say that you don't have to do that altar call again, I'm not saying you will never do an altar call. I'm not saying you will never repent. What I'm saying is that what Christ has done for you doesn't mean that every time you have fallen into sin, every time there was a temptation, maybe on Wednesday, somebody offended you and you just said, waka to the person. Oh, then on January 14th, you now come back. No. On that same day that you said that, you just say, God, I'm sorry. Father, forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. And you continue. The relationship continues. He forgets it. It means that when you come on January 14th to repent about it, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, because the Bible says that he forgives and he forgets. So God determines that he's going to have amnesia on your sin matter. So when you continue to come back and you say, oh, that... You could have just managed the relationship at that time. What you're not understanding is that, no, his sacrifice is, is whole. It's complete. It doesn't have K-leg. You don't have to keep, you know, it's not every week. Is a, his, the sacrifice is okay. But what it does mean is that the relationship is important to you and you continue to manage it well. Are we together? Does it make sense? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want to bring it to a close. I'm over time. Jesus came to fix the root issue of sin. And to also fix all of the, all of the symptoms that we have seen come from sin and death. Scripture tell, tells us, I believe in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. We spoke about that. Fear having come in. That God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. That when you come into Christ, perfect love casts out fear. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to feel worried in the presence of God. You don't have to feel worried that calamity is going to befall you. You don't have to be afraid of anything. You can put your trust in this one who took off his majesty for you, who took off his glory for you, who humbled himself unto death. The Bible says not just any death, but the death of a sinner, the death on the cross, that you can put your trust in him. You can put your faith in him. It doesn't mean that your life will be perfect, that your life will be without challenges. No, because the Bible says that son though he was, obedience was lent by what he suffered. So you will also live that life. Where there's certain things sometimes that don't make sense. Because 
our, our, our kingdom is a kingdom of faith. Not everything you see with your eyes makes sense. That's why the Bible tells you to call the things that aren't as though they were. Because you have the power to be able to create. You have the power to be able to make manifest in the same way that God said, let there be light. That you can speak as the first prophet over your life. And you can move in that direction with new patterns. And you can manifest those words of promises, those words of prophecies that are spoken over your life. That with patterns of repentance, relationship repentance now, I'm not meaning repentance that doesn't quite understand that. No, you're now in a loving relationship. Every time I offend my husband, he doesn't say I want a divorce. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in the same way, every time you slip and you fall, I'm not talking now you're making a habit because the scripture says, right, that those who are born of God do not commit sin habitually. It is impossible. When you are born of God, you have new DNA. Yeah. Your abilities are different. It's like your bloodstream is different. That sickness that infects the sickness of the, the bloodstream of humanity is not worrying you. That sin that is crouching at your door is now at a disadvantage in its attempt to master you. Because you are now in Christ. The Holy Spirit lives within you. The same power that rose Christ from the dead. The strength of the Lord. The might of the Lord. Who gives you the mind of the Lord. Who helps you understand the word of the Lord. And then he has given you his grace. We say that and we'll probably say it at the end. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Many times we say it. Even as believers we don't know what it means. That's why we're going deeper. Church is closing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You hold your neighbor the love of God and the sweet fellowship of his to be with us now forevermore. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is what made him live on the earth. A man like you without sin. He had a grace. He lived with a grace. He has commuted that grace. The Bible says he's the heir of all things. He's the firstborn from the dead. I can't go into all the scriptures where Hebrews talks about all these things that we're talking about. Hebrews, that he's the firstborn from the dead. And he has now made each and every one of us secondborn from the dead. You are raised to life in Christ. Ephesians also speaks about this. I'll give you the Ephesians scripture. I think it's chapter 2. That in Christ we have come to life. Death need reign no longer over us. I'll get it for you before we close. I feel so if media can help me. That in, in Christ, we have been raised to life. So it's a completely different life that we're living now. All of the things that the New Testament now encourages us are fulfillments because grace exists. Titus 2 and verse 11. The grace of God has appeared to us and it teaches us to say no to all ungodliness. All. And to live spiritually upright lives in this present age while we wait for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Until the time that Jesus Christ comes back to rapture his church, to take home his bride, each and every one of us get to live with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. To live under the covering of the love of God. Like I say, whether Cain and Abel, whether Noah, whether Adam and Eve, you see that in the heart of God there is something that makes him favorably disposed towards you. And I want everybody walking out of here today to believe it. God is for you. God is for you. know, there are two ways that a person can live in bondage. I say this when maybe Sunday people come after church in my office, we sit down. There are two ways you can live in bondage. You can live in bondage because you're actually in bondage. And you can live in bondage because you think you are in bondage. Both things are the same. Yeah, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so that man is. If you believe you are in bondage when you're actually free, you may as well actually be in bondage. I'm sure you've heard the story of a bird that was caged all its life. And so one day they opened the gate of the cage 
And they came back and they met the bird there. Why? Because that bird had learned over time that this is my environment. Even though it is the nature of a bird to fly, though the cage gate was open, that bird never came out because that bird thinks that it is in bondage. Are we together? Even when the door is open. It is very important that as you walk out of here today, you know that the door is open. Yet Jesus Christ has made a new and a living way. The Bible says that now because of that, Hebrews, that you can walk boldly, Hebrews 4. You can boldly go forward to the throne of grace, knowing that you can obtain grace and mercy in your time of need. It is what Jesus Christ has done. It is why we repent from acts that lead to death. The Bible says that it is the kindness of God, not the fierceness of God, not the power of God, not the authority, the bang, bang, bang of God, not that. It is not like under the Old Testament. It is not the fear of stoning. It is the kindness of God. Knowing that notwithstanding how I am and my condition, he embraces me. He is for me. Maybe you went to a church before. Maybe you grew up in a type of Christianity before where you were told over and over that God is against you. Where you, le- you have learned to live with so much bondage of religion that even for you to sneeze is a sin. You are taking baited breaths. You are in Christ, but you're not at rest. The only thing it is written for the believer to fear, Paul writes in Hebrews, Be afraid of not entering the rest of the Lord. Be afraid of not entering the rest of God. It's the only thing the believer is to fear. Because life outside of the rest, rest in what Jesus Christ has done for you is a life of bondage. You may as well still go and get your goats, get a farm, get your goats, get your ram and offer them, slaughter them and be under that same stress. Because unless you enter into the rest that Jesus Christ has been your sacrifice and his blood has gone into the mercy seat and he's speaking for you better things and he has given for you better days, like what Revelation says, the lamb has been slain weep no more your life will be a life of bondage you may as well live under the old testament the only thing you are told to fear fear not entering the rest of jesus christ and he makes a call he says while it is today do not harden your hearts as they did again always the bible referring Old Testament to New, New Testament to Old. He says, do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah and Manasseh. Where's Meribah and Manasseh? Is that place that we're talking about that Moses was with the children of Israel. Where water came forth. But guess what? Water came forth. It was the mercy, it was the compassion of God. But God realized that these people, their hearts are stubborn. Their hearts are just so hardened. They're stiff-necked people. I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying, but this is the disposition of their hearts. Hardened towards me. They saw all of the things. I mean, even their enemies then were saying that these people have a God, but Israel could not realize who their God was. I hope our lives are not like that. Where even unbelievers can see a grace over your life. They can see that there's something special about you. They can see that there's something happening. I hope that, huh, I hope that you are not missing Hallelujah Challenge when Muslims are joining Hallelujah Challenge. I hope you are not missing encounters of God. And people who are not naturally disposed to be in encounters with God are encountering God all around the earth. In places where the gospel is suppressed, places like China, places like Saudi Arabia, there are churches that are growing. And then there are Western places, there are places like Africa, that there's a church on every corner and you are still Bible illiterate. Casual with God. People are dying just to have a page of the Bible. Just to have a page that they could know one verse to memorize. That they can, you know, speak it over and over and meditate on it. That their strength and their faith will be built up. That if they have to take their life for Jesus, they will say to the end, I go. And you have the whole full 66 books of the word of God. But to read it is a challenge. To live with that sort of spiritual laxity. That recklessness, to live with that level of unbelief, that level of comfort zone in and of itself is a sin. It's a sin of sloth. 
in and of itself is an act really that is it definitely tends to spiritual death it's not enough to be a good person i hope you know because there are many good people and none of them are even believers if it was enough to be a good person the centurion would have made it in if it was enough to be a good person the lady that came all the way from ethiopia the queen of sheba she wouldn't have bothered coming there's so many good people upon the face of the planet so many kind people upon the face of so many generous people upon the face of the planet even now some of the most generous celebrities are not people that proclaim the name of the lord but it's not enough to be a good person it's not enough to just have this semblance of morality there is only one way now because of what it cost it will be an injustice to the work of jesus christ for god to open the back back door of heaven and say oh yeah yeah come 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 quick 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 before he sees you come 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 no no he gave his son it could have cost he could have paid anything else the cattle on a thousand hills are his he could have said you know what the price for all of these people i peg it at a million goats i peg it at infinity goats he said no i give my child The one thing that God has only one of was what he gave for you. He only had one son, my only begotten son. I have a son now. I tell you, I can't do it for anybody. I can't. No. Who is man that you're mindful of him? Who are you that God is mindful of you? What are you really offering him? Is it to his benefit that you read the Bible or is it to your benefit? Is he really begging you for praise and worship to have time? He says if you don't sing the rocks will cry out. Make no mistake. All of creation is singing his praises. The earth for sh- shows forth your handiwork, the heavens, the stars, the everything. And I'm sure they're even doing it better than us. The one difference is this with us his desire to hear it he has the abundance revelation says angels surrounding his throne day and night holy 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 even the angels they're like how far how far these people every day we are here holy 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 but he desires from us there's just something about us there's just something about us Many people desire love like this. Many people desire to be wanted like this from a human being. You can't get it from a human being. You can't get it. Not your boyfriend, not your girlfriend, not your wife, not your husband, not even your child can love you like this. Can want you like this. And it is from that realization that you are wanted like this. You are seen like this. You are known like this. When you pray, you are heard like this. Is what inspires you to say fornication, pornography, stealing, inflating that contract. That's what Joseph saw and he said, "How will I commit this sin? It will elevate me if I sleep with this lady." But why will I commit the sin against a great God? You're looking for money. They say go and bring this, go and bring that. Do it like this. It's just nobody will die. Oh, there's no blood. Oh, we don't do this. You want to have a man. They say, "Oh, go and do this. Go and do this." Then when you are cooking, put it here. Do it. What is it you're looking for in there? What is it you're really looking for? When you are seen and you are known and you are wanted like this. What shall it profit you to gain the whole world and to forfeit your soul with an act that leads to death with a heart that leads to death with a mindset that is corrupt the bible says that the mind of the flesh is a mind of death you don't even have to act it there is a way to think that tends to death there is a direction you can live that seemeth good to you but the end of it is death let's stand to our feet
We're going to pray to the Lord. Romans 12, in view, in view, it says, of the mercies of God. Because of that compassion that faileth not. Maybe you don't even believe it yet. So let's start with that prayer point. Let your first prayer point be God. God, I may know you as king. I believe you are mighty. You are God. But maybe because of my background, maybe where I'm coming from. Maybe I've never even really experienced the love of a father. Maybe I've never even known a father. It's very hard for me to understand the love of the Father. It's very hard for me to understand the love of God. I get it. I get your power. I get your glory. I get your majesty. I've seen, I've heard that you can do signs and wonders. But my life is where it's at. Because I've not yet come into understanding, really, of your love for me. The same way. Jacob held on to that angel the same way Jabez prays, held on to God. Oh Lord, bless me and enlarge my territory because he identified there was something that was disadvantageous to him. But he encountered a God who he knew could trump that disadvantage. I want you to hold on to him and ask him for an encounter. Flood my heart with your love. I've never understood it before, but from today, let me begin to encounter in strange ways the love of God, the love of the Father, the love of the Father that motivated the Son. How can you live in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ when you don't even believe in the love of the Father? Let's lift, let's turn up the volume, let's lift our voices and let's pray. If you've encountered the love of the Father and you remember what it was like to live outside of that rest. Where it feels like refreshment is upon you. Even when you make a mistake, you know that, oh, you're not condemned. I sat with someone last week and they felt that the Holy Spirit was condemning them, was condemning them. They said, you know, I'm in church and I just feel like the Holy Spirit, when I hear, I feel like the Holy Spirit is condemning me. And I I had to ask them, where have you ever seen in the word of God that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is condemnation? No, it doesn't happen. Romans says there is now therefore no guilt or condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Media, please put it up. Romans 8 and verse 1. Who live now according, what? To the Spirit. It doesn't mean that you will be perfect. But you're living with a consciousness that you're in relationship with the Spirit of God. In relationship with the one true God. You're living with that cognizance. You're carrying it around like we said at the beginning. Above all else, God has hallowed his name and he has hallowed his word. When you live in relationship with him, you hallow his presence. You realize that you're moving with the God of all the, of all the earth. And you can't, just, you can't just be anyhow. You can't just do anyhow. You don't, you don't want to hurt him. Look at what he did for you. Look at what he does for you daily. You hallow the fact that you're in relationship with him. It matters to you. It really matters to you. There is now no guilt or condemnation. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, one, he will remind you of all the things that Jesus Christ has said. The Bible also says this. His ministry is the ministry of conviction. Conviction is different to condemnation. And these are the three areas of conviction. He has come into the world to convict the world of sin. To convict the world of righteousness. And to convict the world of the judgment. He is at work in the world and in the life of a believer to emphasize those three things. That sin is really what it is. So don't, the Bible says that, Grace is not licentiousness for sin. The Holy Spirit lets you know that it is a big thing. It is not a small thing. There is nothing like a white lie. 
Don't have shades. Don't commute sin. Don't lessen it. Don't water it down. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to let you know that. Have a conviction that sin leads to death. That is his ministry. Then he convicts you as to righteousness. What is right standing with God? What does it mean to be in right relationship with God? It means to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You must believe he died for your sins. He is God. He is the son of God. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To let you know that he's making you in the image of Christ. And then he convicts us to the judgment. He lets you know that God is a just God. That when he judges the earth at the end of days, and when he judges sin, he's righteous in it. That this is the judgment that sin is deserving of. Without remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. The Holy Spirit reminds you so that when you remember those mercies of God, Romans 8, Romans 12, in view of those mercies, you give your life as a living sacrifice. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Thank him. That the spirit that he gave you as a gift is not the spirit that condemns you. No, that's the voice of the accuser. The spirit that he gave you casts out fear, reminds you, pick yourself up. Yes, 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 I get it. You're wrestling with sin. But though you fall seven times, a righteous man shall get up eight times. Get up. You have grace to get up. You have grace. Get up. Stand up on your feet. Wash your face. Lift your head up. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit, for your ministry, for the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God, we're grateful. Thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you for his sacrifice. Oh, thank you for everything he lived and died for. Thank you that he didn't do it partially, that he didn't do a fraction of it, but he did it completely. It made a way for me where there seems to be no way. And that way is a living way. Yes, it means that I have to walk on a straight and a narrow path. Make no mistake, every kind of lifestyle has a yoke and a burden. But God has said to you that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you want to live a life of sin, there are consequences. Every form of lifestyle you will avail of upon the earth, it has a yoke, it has a burden, it has a price, it has a weight. But God says, take my cross. Take my cross. Believe me, I have assessed it, and my cross is lighter than that light, than that life of adultery that you want to live. My cross is lighter. My yoke is easier than that yoke that you want to bear. My yoke is easier than that burden that you want to carry. That way that you want to make money. No, believe me. Come to the Oasis Kingdom Wealth Academy. I will remind you and show you that I am the God that teaches you to make wealth. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. There is no life that has no yoke. No life that has no burden. So far as you're in the flesh. And it's for everybody to choose which yoke and which burden. At this point, I want to give an opportunity for anybody in this room. Who has realized that the yoke and the burden of life that they've been carrying is simply too much for them. And you want to exchange it today for the yoke that Christ gives for the burden that he places it is not hard but it does require intentionality let nobody lie to you when you come into Christ there are disciplines there is a protocol there is a lifestyle that repents from dead acts there is a lifestyle that lives oh because it realizes that there is one whose life I am living you are living on a borrowed life you can't live any we, 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 we visited that on Easter Sunday. This is his life. You must live it well. You must live it well. And it does require discipline. But if you're ready to sign up for that life of good discipline, that life of love, that life of joy, that life of righteousness, of peace, of joy in the Holy Ghost, just come down to the front. Come like you're running to claim a billion naira. Run to the front. It is much more valuable than that much more valuable than that. It is offered to us for free, but it costs him everything. 
It cost him everything. Let's begin to, if you're in this room and you've made that decision, just exalt the lamb that was slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Come and exalt the root of Jesse, the one who prevailed on your account, the one who was found worthy to take up the scroll and to loosen their seven seals, the one who has written for you a better day, the one whose blood speaks for you better things. Why don't you intercede for those, whether online or here in person, who need to make that decision? God, that you would give them the grace, that you would give them the courage, that they would not fear the presence of the Lord. They would not fear the yoke and the burden that comes in this lifestyle of Christianity. They wouldn't fear, oh, what are the elemental foundations of the faith, that they must believe that it is Jesus and Jesus alone, that they want to put down every other God. They want to put down the things that the family has taught them. Oh, you can't do with God. You can't do it with God. You cannot do God and Santeria. You cannot do God and Shango. You cannot do God and Oshu. You cannot do God and visit your ancestors. You cannot do God and be doing random things in bowls and plates and what. No, you can't do God like that. If you're ready for that life, come to the front. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If there's no one who is making that decision, right now we're going to lift our nation, Nigeria, and we're going to pray for salvation. Righteousness exalts a land. We're going to intercede for the destiny of this nation. This nation has, we've talked about prophetic, poetic, prophetic things. A real word of prophecy has been spoken over Nigeria. That this land will be a righteousness, a land of righteousness. That one day people will take Nigerians by the hand and they will say, come with us. We want to learn of your God. We want to learn of your God. It seems impossible now, but with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Let's turn up the volume and let's begin to pray for the conviction of the Holy Ghost upon this land, God. Upon this land. That the Holy Spirit that broods over darkness will brood over the darkness in the land. Pray from the top to the bottom, from the leaders to the least of these. Let's lift up. We're under commandment to pray for all men. We lift up our voices for all men, especially those who are in positions of influence. You pray for your president who currently doesn't confess the Lord as Savior or oh Lord. Pray for him that he might know the Lord, that his eyes might be open, that he might have an encounter. Pray for them that trouble your land. Pray for Boko Haram, that as Saul encountered the Lord on the road to Damascus, that they would encounter the Lord, that the Lord God Almighty would take those lives. And will make them call. There is nothing impossible with the Lord. Thank you, everlasting Father. God, we speak salvation over Nigeria. From the north to the south, from the east to the west. We stand as priests, as intercessors for our land. God, we say have mercy upon the land. We are your watchmen, God Almighty. We say, have mercy upon Nigeria. Forgive her of her sins, God. Wash her with your blood. The sacrifices that have been done in darkness, the daily living of dead acts, even by those that profess your name, that cause your name to be profaned in the earth, God Almighty, upon it all. That which we know about and that which we do not know about, God, we say, have mercy have mercy have mercy let your forgiveness god almighty flow like a river like a river god from the ashes may this nation rise god may this nation rise when there is righteousness oh the economy will be exalted every other thing will fall into place we will be able to command obedience when our we'll be able to command disobedience rather when our obedience is complete lord we thank you thank you for this house and thank you for your word that heals, that saves, that delivers. And I pray that in this place, God, it has brought liberty. Let it all be to the glory of your name, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Let us stretch our hands towards Pastor Yinko and begin to speak life to her life. Let us begin to pray for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to multiply in her life in Jesus' name. In her marriage, in her family, let us pray for more unction, 
from above in Jesus name that she will be a mighty battle axe in the hands of the Lord to the ends of the world in the name of Jesus that the Lord will continue to strengthen her in Jesus name the Lord will continue to keep her and her family in the name of Jesus that each time we hear from her it shall be good news in Jesus name that through her that the kingdom will continue to grow in Jesus name let us cover her with the blood of Jesus her family her husband her baby with the blood of Jesus we pray that the hands of the Lord will never leave her in the name of Jesus that the Lord will continue to speak to her and she will continue to hear and deliver the word of truth in the name of Jesus thank you Lord in Jesus mighty name we have prayed in Jesus mighty name we have prayed praise the Lord so, so please have your seat it's time for announcements so we are going to listen to the Oasis media Oasis Media. church good morning and welcome to this week's announcement sunday service is held in this auditorium starting at 8 a.m with sunday school followed by the worship service by 9 a.m parents are encouraged to register their children in the children's church good morning holy spirit holds every monday morning from 5 a.m on zoom church members can get the link on the church whatsapp groups those here to join the groups can contact the ushers or media teams to be added our midweek service called Search the Scripture is held physically here every Wednesday at 6 p.m. It's a time to dig deeper into the Word of God and find refreshment for our souls. Believers Foundation class holds after service for new converts and church members who are yet to attend. The launch of the Oasis Kingdom World Academy, as earlier announced, was held over the weekend. What an impactful time it was for attendees and everyone present. This academy has been specifically structured to build financial giants with godly character and a strong work ethic. And believers are expected to be equipped with winning skills to represent Christ in their various fields as they fulfill their assignments on earth. Please go to oasisworldacademy.com to register to be a part of this groundbreaking initiative. We are encouraged while giving to the church through bank transfers to include the proper narration for giving. Please follow the church on all our social media platforms. Our handle is the Oasis Lagos across all platforms. Thank you and have a wonderful week ahead. Bye. Praise the Lord. Good news, Oasis. So the Lord has added to his church on Monday through the families of brother and sister Akinkumi in your dad and Busayo Akinkumi, a bouncy baby girl. Praise the Lord. Is that how you're going to rejoice when you hear a good news? Hallelujah. And also we had a baby boy on the same Monday. Praise the Lord. So the, uh, the family of brother Chuku Chidiebere and sister Ishe were also blessed with a bouncy baby boy. Hallelujah! Both on Monday. So we have started receiving our good news. Praise the Lord. And also our 9 p.m. prayers also continues every day. So you are enjoined to also plug in. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let's quickly do this so that we... Come back for swap. Please, can you write this down on your diary? Laughter. Write it big. Just write it down. Just follow instruction. Do you know that yesterday I got that word in my spirit? Very, very strong. And if you followed this ministry for a while, you know that every now and then we get prophetic words and they come to pass only to receive the, the names for the baby dedication now, which we'll do very swiftly. 
And the first name I saw there is Isaac Laughter. Amen. Let's welcome the family of um, Junie. Did you write the family's name? Um, June and Sarah. What's the surname again? You know I'm not Benin and those names. I what? You heard them. <laughs> Put your hands together and let's celebrate. Come and see the Lord is good. Quickly, quickly, quickly. This is the last thing we're doing. Are you okay? This is a prophetic child. This is a prophetic child. Say laughter. As you laugh, you will laugh at mountains and they'll dissolve. I said I'm prophesying already. God will give you reasons to laugh. Before the end of April, you will have cause to laugh. Psalm 127, I believe. Let's go. 127. This is a, a prophetic child. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman wicked but in vain. It is in vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows for he giveth his beloved sleep. Verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Amen. Now let's look at the names very quickly. Number one name there is Isaac Laughter. Number two is Blessed. Number three is Osegale, God's gift. Number four is Inyolua, God's treasure. And we have Daniel. Hallelujah. Quickly stretch forth your hands over this child and begin to declare those names that God has sent us his time of laughter. I remember calling June to say, you know what, this child shall be Isaac. Didn't even remember this name while I was on Instagram yesterday. And I was on Genesis 24, speaking about Isaac and Rebecca. And here we are, God sending us a token and a sign. June and Sarah, but this one is a special child. This one will cause you to laugh. Amen. This one will cause the oasis to laugh. Amen. His coming is a sign to this church Amen. in this season. Father, we thank you for Isaac, for blessed Osegale, Inyolua, treasure, Daniel. We dedicate him in the name of the Father Amen. and of the Son Amen. and of the Holy Spirit. We declare that his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. Amen. We declare that he will grow in leaps and bounds. Amen. You fill him with the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Amen. He grows in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Amen. We use him as a testament for every other one believing God for a baby. 
that their time to laugh shall come. Amen. Their time to rejoice shall come. Amen. In fact, it has come. Amen. In the next 12 months, they will dance forward saying, On this day, 14th of April, the day Isaac was dedicated, my own laughter came. In Jesus' name. We dedicate him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. OC shout it better. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give them a minute each to share that to respond by way of testimony. Amen. I give you all the time. Amen. Praise God, church. Uh, today is the day of Thanksgiving because God has just been faithful to my family. And I just want them to thank you for strength throughout the whole pregnancy period. I didn't even believe the type of strength that I had when I was pregnant. God helped me through it all. And the day he came forth, he came forth <laughs> suddenly. I didn't, even, I didn't realize I was in labor on time. I think I even still called me that they were arguing about fire extinguisher, whether I should buy a big one or small one in church. <laughs> and I just told him that I'm feeling funny, I'm going to church. And he said, which is one prayer that PM prays that I love. He said, God has gone ahead of you. That was all he said to me. So I just went there with plenty to do that. Like, once PM prays that prayer, that nothing, nothing scares me anymore. And we got there. I was still drifting with the nurses. And before they could even arrange, like, a gurney, and before they could put things together, the baby was already coming out. We had to rush and, you know, get him out. Because I saw that prayer chain was already going up before... <laughs> I don't even know if they finished the prayers and baby had already come. I just want to thank God. And I want to pray for everyone. I want to pray for everyone believing God for the fruits of the womb. I pray that it will come beautifully. You will carry the baby with enough strength. And on the day when you will bring forth, it will be with ease in Jesus' name. Amen. I also like to thank the church. You people were my, were my backbone. I am very grateful. In fact, the, the love... Somebody came for my naming and saw the way we were all interacting like brothers and sisters. We grew up in the same household. And she was like, man, that you guys love each other. I just want to thank God for the Oasis. Oasis is God's gift to me and my family. I am grateful for each and every one of you. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank my husband. <laughs> he was my... <laughs> Please, if you see him, please let me dash him dollars. He was, in fact, I stressed him. I won't lie. <laughs> God bless you, my husband. Thank you. PM. Thank you, sir. The husband won't talk. <laughs> um, I want you to give thanks to God for giving us Isaac. Like Pastor already said, um, um, the day she was I had to take her to the hospital to just check and and see if it's time for her to stay back in the hospital and you know, go through the process. Uh, PN just called and said, you know, uh, this is what he's saying, that this is the name of, the, of, of, of my baby that will be coming. I said, okay. But I remember when, when my wife gave birth, I keep telling her that this, this, this baby is a blessing, you know. Even before, you know, I keep telling her that this baby is a blessing, and I'm really seeing the hand of God in our lives through the baby. Uh, I thank God for everything. He, he always going, he's always going ahead of us. When we gave birth to our, when my wife gave birth to, I, uh, to David, when the church were praying, and same thing happened. You know, God loves us so much. He loves this church so much, and we are so grateful to God. We also want to thank the church. Um, you know, um, you know our pastors, they are very busy people. They are very, very busy people, you know. So God, God really loves us so much that almost all of them just turn up for the naming. It was a real privilege, you know. I want to thank our pastor, Pastor Nat, Pastor, and the wife. I want to thank Pastor Phil, uh, Pastor Oinko, Phil, and Baz. They all came, came Pastor Mike. Twa! <laughs> I want to thank everyone. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand? Can we stand and close? That brother, come here, you come. Stretch forth your hands towards him. You. Yes. Stretch forth your hands over him. 
There's food for everybody after the service. Put your hands on your chest. Come against heart attack. His chest area. Pray that you know the God will keep him strong. Open your mouth and pray as we close. Father, we cover him in the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We use him as a point of contact to every man here. There, there, won't, there will not be a sudden cardiac arrest, chest pain, heart issues, in the name of Jesus. Let the sign of the prisoners come to you. According to the greatness of power, preserve those who are appointed to die. In Jesus' name. Join your hands together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Say thank you, Pastor Oinko, for that word. See you for swap. Before you go, go to three people that you don't know. Ask their names. Ask what they do. And ask how you can help them. Brothers, if you are smart, go to a sister. That sister you'll be eyeing. See you praise worship. That you are not concentrating. Go now. Go to a what do you do? Say, how may I help you? Three people, three people. Father, for everyone who goes to three people, bless them. Make them laugh first. Let them laugh first. somebody I need you to help me pay my house rent three people three, you must go to three people swap is in the evening swap there is popcorn for children I hear there is I hear there is a sue.